It looks great. Really apologize for the technical difficulties, everybody. Uh, good morning. My name is Mark Paltzell. I'm the statewide salmon and steelhead manager for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Welcome to our North of Falcon number two meeting. Uh, we're going to run through some Zoom hybrid logistics this morning. Thanks, everybody, for, for hanging in there with us. Um, for those folks on the Zoom meeting, you can turn your camera uh, on and mute and unmute yourself through the panel at the bottom of your screen. We'll keep folks muted during the beginning of the program and then unmute folks when it's time for questions and feedback. Callers who are using a phone can mute and unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. We ask that folks raise their hand to ask a question. For folks in the room here, we ask that when uh, we call you uh, to ask a question that you come forward and ask it into the microphone. Uh, it's the way that we capture your question for the Zoom meeting today. <clears throat> Uh, for callers that are, or for people on the screen, you can raise your hand by hovering over your face or name on the list of participants. Callers can also raise their hand by dialing star nine. We're asking that folks please be respectful of others. Uh, mute your phone or your line when you're not talking. Uh, be tough on the issues and questions, not on people or organizations. Please no personal attacks, insults, or threats. Uh, we're here to listen, uh, act, speak, and act professionally. And we're really trying to allow for a balance of speaking time so everybody can get their questions in and answered today. Uh, just for folks uh, reference, this meeting is being recorded and will be available on our website uh, in the coming days, uh, likely by the end of the day today or tomorrow. If you have any technical issues during the call, please go ahead and use the chat feature. Uh, try to refrain from questions beyond technical issues within the chat. There we go. So as I said, uh, North of Falcon number two here, uh, March 29th, uh, we're gonna do some quick uh, housekeeping stuff to, to go through this morning, just some really quick uh, things on the North of Falcon process. We're gonna quickly go through our management objectives and some current modeling. Um, and then we'll take some general questions on the process, uh, but we will be going into breakout meetings. Uh, folks uh, will stay in this room to talk about Puget Sound recreational fisheries for marine and freshwater. Uh, we'll be able to do another breakout for commercial uh, interests. And then if there's any other folks in the room who want to talk about uh, coastal fisheries, uh, ocean or Columbia River, we may not have all the staff in the room, but we can definitely talk to you, find some right people, talk to you and get you uh, uh, take your comments. So what guides North of Falcon? Uh, fishery managers each year have to weigh a lot of different factors when we're developing salmon, salmon seasons along the West Coast. Uh, we have ESA constraints. Uh, we have commission policy, uh, Pacific Salmon Treaty obligations. Uh, obviously, we, we co-manage these resources with the, the treaty tribes of Western Washington and the Columbia River. Uh, and uh, as part of this process, we, all we also conduct extensive monitoring and evaluation of these fisheries statewide. So North of Falcon is the annual cooperative process that salmon sets salmon seasons in Washington. The name refers to uh, Oregon's Cape Falcon, which marks the southern border of Washington's management of salmon stocks. And it is one component, as I said, in a larger salmon season setting process. The Northern Falcon process is also part of our annual rulemaking process around salmon seasons. Uh, in early January, we file a 101, uh, which is an intent to, to change rules. This process is kind of in the middle part there where we develop these salmon seasons through a public process. Uh, CR 102 is when we will actually uh, publish those and take comments and hold hearings on the proposed seasons as part of the rulemaking process. Uh, towards the end of May or into June, we'll uh, file the CR 103 with a concise explanatory statement. The director will sign the rules, and then 31 days after that, they will be official rules for the year. Uh, just give folks a little bit of uh, a see where the ocean options are. Uh, starting this weekend, folks will be traveling to the Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting in California where we'll take these ocean alternatives down to a single ocean alternative for this year. Uh, right now, the uh, you see the alternatives uh, on the screen.
coho um, um, ocean quotas are very similar to last year and uh, Chinook uh, quotas or proposed uh, quotas are higher this year. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our modeling team, Derek Dack and Dapp and Angelica Hagenbro. They're going to run through some uh, management objectives. Thanks, Mark. And maybe starting with the Columbia River in the ocean and maybe starting with Chinook. Uh, on screen now, you see some of our objectives for coastal and Columbia River stocks, uh, also for interior Fraser for coho. Um, for lower Columbia natural toolies, uh, those are the primary constraining Chinook stock on the ocean. They have been for several years. And if uh, folks have followed the PFMC process, uh, last year we had a 38% total exploitation rate objective for that stock. Um, and this year we have a, uh, sim similarly, we have a 38% total exploitation rate objective for that stock. We'll look more about how some of the initial modeling shakes out um, across the three ocean options uh, on that stock in future slides. Um, but uh, for now, maybe Angelica, did you have any comments on some of the coho objectives? Um, yeah, so you're, you're doing ocean and, and Columbia River right now. As far as uh, Columbia River stocks go, um, everything looks fine. We're, uh, we have a management of objective for lower Columbia naturals of 23%, uh, and we're um, way below at 20%. Um, the oceans, the um, Oregon Coast Naturals are uh, at twenty percent, which is exactly their management objective, and that is by design. So people actually uh, shape their fisheries to fish up to that management objective. And as far as um, coastal stocks go, we've had some really nice forecasts this year. Um, all the ocean uh, coastal stocks are in good shape. We haven't received updates uh, for in-river fisheries. Um, and because of that, we don't know exactly where we're at, but it definitely looks like based on the forecast and everything we've seen so far, uh, the coastal stocks will not be constraining. And so maybe moving into some of the initial modeling results for uh, Chinook. Um, on screen now, uh, folks uh, might be familiar with this screen. This is our typical outputs from our uh, Chinook model. Um, maybe just to briefly go over some points here, um, and um, it might be hard to see if you're in the room, but um, kind of um, in the middle set of columns, we have our management criteria. Um, you can see there, there's an abundance tier, an exploitation rate ceiling, and an exploitation rate type associated with each stock. There's different metrics in terms of the exploitation rate type that we're managing to for each stock. You can see, for example, uh, Nooksack Springs, uh, the first stock on the list is listed as an SUS ER type that stands for Southern US. And basically that management objective means that we're looking at the impact of fisheries uh, that are South of Canada as we're assessing that stock. You might notice some of the other stocks are designated as a total ER type, and that would represent the impacts of all fisheries from Alaska down to California um, on, on that stock. Um, there are some cases, uh, such as for the Midsound stocks, where they're designated as a PTSUS ER type, um, and that represents a pre-terminal southern U.S., so that objective would be based on, um, on any fisheries that are south of Canada and occurring uh, outside of the river of origin for those stocks. So um, on screen now, um, what's represented in the modeling is um, the current outputs from uh, the modeling with the high ocean option. Uh, once again, that's 85,000 Chinook is in that high ocean option. And um, for Puget Sound stocks, uh, the first one that I'd call our attention to is Stilaguamish. Stilaguamish is one that has a 9% unmarked Southern US management objective and a 13% marked SUS management objective. And you can see in the current modeling outputs, we're coming out at 12.5 and 18% respectively on those two metrics. So as in previous years, uh, Stilaguamish is likely to be one of our primary constraining stocks for fisheries uh, this year. Um, however, there are a few other stocks that I think that are worth highlighting um, that we should be considering as we're shaping our modeling. And um, the ones that I might mention are uh, Nooksack Springs, which currently in the high ocean option is at 14.2% in the southern U.S. relative to its 10.9% uh, southern U.S. management objective. Skagit Summer Falls, um, which are falling below their low abundance threshold, particularly for the SOC subcomponent of the stock. You can see that necessitates a 17% Southern U.S. management objective, and currently in the modeling, we're coming out at 26.5. Uh, Snohomish is kind of an interesting stock. There's two objectives there. Um, it's either a 
a 20% total exploitation rate, or if there's a particularly large northern fisheries in a given year, then it switches to an 8.3% southern U.S. exploitation rate. From the preliminary modeling, it looks like it would actually be easier to achieve that 20% total exploitation rate. So that's a stock that we're going to be mon monitoring as we're moving forward with the modeling. Um, Nisqually, um, uh, we mentioned in some of the past meetings that there was a chance that it could fall below its low abundance threshold. And you see kind of on screen here, that stock has fallen below its low abundance threshold. That does necessitate kind of a stricter management objective on the Squally stock. However, from what we've seen in the modeling, it seems like it would be easier to achieve getting back above that low abundance threshold through fishery changes than it would be to um, achieve the 20% Southern US objective that you see on screen now. Um, the last stock that I might highlight is uh, Skokomish, which has a 50% total exploitation rate objective and is currently coming out at 53.5% in the modeling. One thing that isn't on screen here, but I think is probably worth mentioning, um, is that uh, right now, um, across the range of ocean options from high to low, um, we do see the lower Columbian natural Thule ERs ranging between 39.1% and the high alternative um, to the low alternative being 36.4. So a, a range of ocean options there that, that uh, meets and exceeds the uh, uh, Thule ER, depending on kind of what we're looking at. And now maybe if we can move on to the next screen, uh, we could have Angelica walk through some of the COHO modeling results. All right, so uh, for COHO, we had um, a, a model run last night. So if you are familiar with what we presented previously, uh, there will be some slight changes. And I actually put the old values in, in brackets and parentheses so you can uh, see where we were and where we are now with the uh, shaping that has happened as well. There were a few corrections that went into the new model run. And uh, one of the stocks uh, that was right at the management objective of 10% SUS was the interior Fraser Thompson stock that oftentimes ends up being a constraining stock for us. And we were right up there uh, with the changes. We went from 10% to 9.7%. So we gained some wiggle room uh, on that stock. I just misspoke, by the way, about the lower Columbia natural with the management objective of 23. We're actually at 18.5. So I think I said 20. Uh, Strait of Juan de Fuca um, has a reduction of a half a percent, but we're very far away from the total exploitation rate objective of 40%. Uh, so definitely not a constrainer. Uh, all the other stocks uh, have uh, small reductions uh, based on the run that happened last night. So for example, Hood Canal went from 44.3 to 44.2. Um, management objective is 45. And the stocks that are highlighted are the ones uh, where we're not meeting the management objective. And the first one is Skagit Natural, the management objective was 60% last year and this year uh, it's at 35%. So uh, huge reductions had to happen to get down from the high exploitation rate we were allowed last year. We're at 37.6%, which is 0.3% lower than in the last run uh, that you would have seen. So we got some savings on that one. Stilly looks good. And Snohomish was the other stock where uh, we didn't meet the escapement goal on this one. The uh, management objective of 40%, uh, we definitely were under. We we're at around 35% in the latest run, but uh, we're under 50,000 escapement. And last um, week, we were at 49,148. And with the changes in this model run, we're almost at 50,000. So we're just 26, 26 fish short of the 50,000 in this new run. So just to kind of wrap up our morning uh, session, so we're going to go through some of the recreational considerations for this, uh, or it's just the general considerations for the salmon season. Uh, so forecast for Puget Sound, Chinook, and Coho stocks have modestly improved over recent years. Chinook stocks continue to be depressed relative to their status at listing and designated in crisis in the state of salmon report from 2020. Um, that has not changed. Uh, there are low expected returns of natural Chinook to a number of systems, which were highlighted earlier. <clears throat> Skagit Coho is in the lower management tier, um, as Angelica just went through. Chum stocks continue to be in low status, and there are continued concerns for SRKW or Southern Resident Killer Whales. 
So with that, just want to go through some of the upcoming um, meetings and public comment period that's happening currently. So our online commenting portal is open and will remain open. Um, some upcoming public meetings that folks might be interested in uh, today is also the Upper Columbia and Snake River Fisheries discussion that is in person in Kennewick tonight at 6 p.m. So if you drive really fast, you might make it for those who are in the room. Um, there tomorrow, there's a joint Willapa Bay and Grace Harbor fishery discussion uh, via Zoom at 6 p.m. And then again, next week is the Pacific uh, Fisheries Management Council number two meeting in Foster City, California. We will have daily updates at 9 a.m. via Zoom. Um, and all of that information is available on the website, including registration for all of those meetings. And I believe that takes us to the end of this morning's presentation and we're happy to open it up to questions. <laughs> And for those who have been involved in these meetings the last several weeks, we'll kind of go with the alternating in, in the room question and then on the on Zoom question. So Leah, any questions online? Nope. <clears throat> nope. We don't have any hands raised at the moment. And just to remind folks, uh, if you're on the phone, star nine to raise your hand. Um, if you're on the computer, you probably have a raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. You might also have a reactions tab. Um, and I see that Tony raised his hand. Uh, Tony, go ahead. Oh, no, Tony, we can't hear you. We can, I can see you raising your hand, but and I can see that you're on the Oh, I'm getting feedback. feedback. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, Tony. Um, I got some questions on the uh, Nooksack this year. Um, I've got your forecast here of 24,997 uh, pinks. Um, that's a very low number. And my question is, uh, is there going to be a tribal cutback uh, from six days a week in the month of August and September on uh, Nooksack pinks? And is there going to be a mesh size uh, increase uh, and just fish for Chinook? Um, because the wrecks are closed for conservation issues. So I feel that the tribe should be cut back. And also I have a question on Nooksack chums. Um, you have a forecast of 34,025 chums. Again, is there going to be a tribal harvest for Nooksack chums in the Nooksack River and Bellingham Bay? And is the chums going to be closed for the wrecks in the Nooksack River? Those are my two questions. Thanks for that, Tony. So. <clears throat> We were actually mostly just taking general questions about North of Falcon or some of the information we presented in the first meeting. Uh, we can uh, try to answer those now. I'm not so sure the biologists are in the room ready to. Uh, the, the better place to try to answer those would be in our breakout session, which is happening in about five minutes. Um, I don't know that we've exactly uh, gotten all the tribal fisheries proposals to answer your question, but we can definitely try to gather that information and get it to you, Tony. Okay, thank you. There I went. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. And that was it for online, Mark. So I'm not really seeing any hands in the room. I think, uh, oh, Shannon, go ahead. Come on up to the table, please. Yeah, Shannon Moore, uh, Bellingham, Washington, Puget Sound Gillnet Fisherman. So what I want to go over this. Um, Thompson question. Cool. Uh, so at the last meeting, uh, we heard that the forecast for Thompson Coho was 86K. Is that, I think that's still a solid number. And um, you've got uh, two ERs. One, one is uh, on the coast. And the other one's inside. So uh, at 86K, it seems like we're looking at exploitation rate of 8.6K 8, 8 that's split between the coast and 
inside waters, um, I'm thinking. Um, then uh, at the same meeting in, in Lacey, I heard, and it might've been a sportsman said that um, over the past five years, they've been meeting and exceeding their escapement goal for the uh, uh, Thompson system um, by 100% plus. So uh, it seems to me that um, maybe we'd go a little bit higher on that, allow for a little more harvest. Um, what happens to the fishermen up on the Canadian line, like myself fishing at Point Roberts is, um, Our fishery gets impacted. I mean, we don't get to fish. We get, we don't get to fish uh, on the chums um, in a regular fashion. Uh, when we do, we're shut down in the middle, and then we have this issue of releasing all wild coho. And I, I think that um, uh, to be fair here, to share the impacts, which I'd like to see happen that um, the uh, non-treaty gillnet fishermen get some impacts to give us a full fishery. So that's what I have to say. You're probably gonna hear me say that for the next 10 years. And I've been saying it for quite a while now. And we have this Thompson question and, um, all, uh, there's been quite a bit of conservation work done by not fishing. And um, I think it's time to harvest a, a few more of those. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Is there another hand in the room? Go ahead, come forward, please. Good morning. Uh, my name is Doug Carlberg. And I live in Bellingham. And first, I'd like to thank all you folks for driving here, putting this meeting on. Uh, sometimes I forget to say thank you. And it's, uh, I, I, I see you guys in here an hour before the meeting and putting in the effort to make sure that everybody gets to hear and speak and, and uh, disseminate the information that uh, there's been quite a bit of work go into before it gets here. So, First, thank you. So I got a technical question. The director is sitting in the back of the room. How do you say his last name? Shuswind? Susawind. Susawind. Okay, I'll try that. So <laughs> these comments, and I've got my back to the director, but I want to speak to him. And so there's nothing... I'm not being disrespectful, director. I'm just uh, having to deal with the microphone pointed the wrong direction. So, right now, Washington State has a harvestable surplus predicted of pinks, pink salmon, that will feed 10 to 20 million meals to people. And there's not much of a plan to harvest them. I think this is a horrible plan, and I think it's an unconscionable plan. It's not just critical we feed human beings. And most of them don't sit in this room. I mean, they're out there living their lives. But every day in this country and in this state, pink salmon are served primarily to poor people, food banks, senior nutrition programs, and school lunch programs. And Washington State happens to be in a unique position because we have a large population base very close to where the fish are. These pink salmon have the lowest carbon footprint to harvest and send it to the consumer of any, I gotta be careful here, probably any salmon in the world. And the plan to harvest them is 
I'm going to be kind here. It's anemic. Never in my 51 years of being in this business have I ever seen 10 to 20 million meals available for human beings, for human consumption, nutritious and affordable and fresh and at a low price. And there's no plan to harvest them, no serious plan. There just hasn't been much effort put into this. So I, I'm here to tell you that, I, in my opinion, we need a course change. And at this later date, the course change can only come from one person, and that's the, the director sitting behind me. Hopefully, he's not making faces or anything. Um, but I think it's important, and I think it's a serious issue. Uh, I, I, I just, uh, I, I don't, I don't know if who publicly could not support feeding 10 or 20 million meals, you know, because there's politics and all this stuff. But, you know, the truth is, we have the tools. We know we have the tools. We have the science. We've developed it. You know, the Live boxes and those kinds of things have all been developed by scientific staff here and DFO and BC, and they work, and we can prove they work. So I think we have the tools to do a far better job than what the plan is here right now. That's a lot of fish. It's going to just be wasted. For example, in this Quality River, if I read your numbers correctly, you have no fishery, targeted fishery planned on it. And it's currently projected to return 79 times the required escapement to keep it sustainable. I've never seen that my whole life, and I've been doing this a long time. And I think we haven't been in this situation in Washington State for a long time. And I think it's time to rethink what our priorities are when we're in a situation where we have 10 to 20 million meals we can feed to people. That hasn't happened to this state for decades, but I think we, we're gonna have it this year and I think we should feed people. And so I'll start by concluding that, you know, the first person to stand at the bottom of Mount Everest and say, I think I can climb that mountain. He was surrounded by people who I call naysayers. And they're people that put up objections till no end. Well, I'll tell you something about naysayers. If we'd listen to them for the 10,000 or 20,000 years humans have been on Earth, we'd still be living in caves. We have the tools, and I think it deserves a really genuine effort. So, Director, let's, let's, let's at least try to climb that mountain. Because at the end of the day, serving 10 or 20 million meals this summer would be a great thing to accomplish. And only you can sit down with your staff and say, Let's give it a good try. Let's give it a good try. And that would turn, that would give us a course change. So I'm asking you to consider that seriously. Let's feed some people, Director. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Other questions or comments? Great. Well, we are going to take about five minutes and we're going to try to keep it short. Uh, we Are we in 401 for the commercial breakout? Do we know? So room 401, go over to the elevators up to the fourth floor and it's right as you step off the elevators. That's where the commercial breakout will be. Uh, so for those folks who are here and interested in commercial fisheries discussion for this year, that's where you're going to meet next. Uh, everybody who's interested in Puget Sound uh, recreational fisheries, we're going to stay right here in this room. Uh, and then anybody who has other interested fisheries, coastal fisheries, uh, um, ocean, Columbia River, 
uh, we'll have make your, you know, come on up, let us know, and we'll make staff available uh, to have discussion with you as well. So thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll be back in five minutes.
Hey, everybody, I think we're going to get started. I would encourage folks, uh, if you can't see very well, there are plenty of seats up front here uh, with the screen. Um, we did have a few technical problems this morning, as well as uh, having these presentations online. Uh, I think we got all that fixed with our IT department. So if folks online are listening uh, and had some problems with the information this morning, that should all be fixed at this point. So. So thanks again for being here, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about Puget Sound recreational fisheries, uh, marine or fresh waters on the table. I think we have plenty of staff in the room that can address concerns or take comments or answer questions for everybody. Uh, so thanks for being here. Um, again, we're going to just run through the current season proposals for both Chinook and Coho, uh, primarily in the marine waters. We can answer those questions if there's specific uh, freshwater questions about seasons. Uh, we're going to talk through some of the considerations around crafting seasons this year. And then uh, uh, Derek, uh, uh, our, our Chinook Fram modeler, also has a, a number, uh, an updated tool for us to think about and, and evaluate some different season proposals and walk through that information with folks today. So um, with that, um, Kirsten, do you want to walk us through current co-host seasons? Hear me okay? Um, so this is uh, the coho proposed seasons that came out of the North of Falcon 1 um, modeling component. So there are a couple of updates that we'll be presenting on it today as well. Um, so you can kind of see here uh, the, the layout for the coho seasons as they're currently proposed. Um, not a whole lot of changes to talk about here. The big changes here are area seven. Uh, we do have some non-selective time that's modeled in. Areas five and six, we also have some non-selective time modeled in towards the end of the season. Um, areas eight one and eight two are non-selective and there's a little bit of extra time in there compared to last year. Uh, there's also some non-selective time modeled into area nine. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, that kind of walks through all of the, the changes. <clears throat> So again, uh, the matrix I showed was from the first North of Falcon modeling. And so this is the changes uh, that were proposed after that first initial modeling component. So in areas five and six, we had it modeled as mark selective through the 28th of September. And then we had two non-selective weekends that were originally modeled, uh, the 23rd, 24th, and 29th, 30th. Um, again, there are some updates here that I'll go through next. In area seven, we have a uh, non-selective time modeled in. Um, this is a one coho limit. And that was again for those uh, July weekend openers coinciding with the Chinook season. And then starting um, the 31st of August, it was open seven days for coho. <clears throat> and again, um, that would be a one coho limit non-selective through the 17th of September. Again, there's updates here that I'll go through next. Area 8-1, you see it's modeled non-selective uh, from 8-1 through the end of September. Area 2 was originally modeled as non-selective from August 1st through the end of September as well with a one coho limit. There is an update there that I'll go through next. Area 9 is marked selective for those weekend openers in July through the end of July. And then starting on August 31st through September 17th, it's marked selective. And then there's some non-selective time built into Area 9 the end of September through the first week in October. Um, areas 10 and 11, the biggest change there is that we have the 10 and 11 winter seasons coinciding with each other, so that's a February through March time period. Area 12, because it's a pink year, we'll have a July 10th start, and area 13, there is no change. So again, that's the North of Falcon 1 proposed season. So we had some shaping that we needed to do with some to reach our management objectives of some of the stocks, and that's kind of what Angelica walked through earlier today. So considering that and some uh, comments that we heard from everybody after the first couple of meetings, we um, built in some changes to the initial proposal. In area five and six, that includes um, going mark selective from the 1st of July through the end of September, and then building in non-selective time in October. Um, and that saved a lot on Thompson having that non-selective time pushed back into October. So that would be non-selective now from October 1st to the 15th. So the first two weeks there. 
In area seven, again, we had a lot of savings by going mark selective um, from the July openers, those three-day openers coinciding with Chinook um, and the month of August, and then switching over from to non-selective in September. And then that non-selective time period would take us from September 1 through the end of September. So we heard a lot of comments about wanting to have more, uh, more time for coho fishing in area seven. So this kind of adds that back in. And then in area eight two, um, the new proposal is to open August 1st, and then it would be ending a little bit earlier. The original proposal was for the end of September, and now we would be ending that fishery about a week early, and that saved a lot on both Snohomish and uh, Skagit <clears throat> um, numbers. So that's now through the 24th. <clears throat> So next slide is, uh, this is the Chinook proposed seasons. And for those of you who have been around for the last couple of meetings, there have been no recent changes to Chinook proposed seasons. So this is the, the matrix that was presented last week during public meetings as well. So um, when we go to the next slide, I can kind of walk through what the changes are for this year. Um, so area five and six, there's really no changes to those seasons. Um, area seven, again, we're going to have those weekend openers for Chinook starting July 13th. So that'll be the Thursday, Friday, Saturday openers. Um, and we we had the way we had that set up is really similar to the way we did it last year, where we have three days are, that are modeled and proposed, and then we'll be able to open it by in-season updates if there's quota that allows us to do that. For area nine in the month of July, we will again have those three day openers coinciding with that uh, July 13th start in area seven. Um, and then it will open to seven days a week beginning on uh, August or July 31st. Area 10, again, we will have that July 13th start. And again, that to coincide with the area seven and nine openers. Um, and then the winter fishery will again be February through March. And in area 11, again, that winter fishery will be February and March to coincide with area 10. And then in areas 12 and 13, we currently have no changes to last year's fisheries. So again, just some recreational considerations for this year. As we know, Stiligwama Chinook, uh, the conservation limits will continue to drive most of the recreational opportunity. This is something that we've talked about a lot, so it should not come as a surprise to everybody in this room and on Zoom right now. Um, you know, we've really been trying to consider maximizing our fishing opportunities within the available impacts and the conservation constraints. And that's kind of what I we just walked through with some of the updated coho seasons is trying to maximize the time we can have on the water, uh, considering, you know, we have changes to make that would get us to reach our management objectives. Um, we have been taking a lot of, of closer looks at the recent year variability and effort trends, um, and this is some of the modeling components that Derek will probably walk through in a little bit. Uh, we have seen increased effort in over historical averages in the last several years, whether that's a, a COVID effect or whether that's just, you know, the increase in popularity of some of these fisheries and increased population. Uh, there's just more effort, so this is something that we need to take into consideration as we're modeling out these fisheries. Um, and then finally, pinks will be part of the daily limit in most areas. Uh, there might be some areas where we can do additional shaping with pinks, but for the most part, it'll be part of the daily limit. So uh, we have heard a lot of feedback from uh, this season so far from the public. So thank you to everybody who's written in with comments and suggestions. We really appreciate it. Um, so we've heard uh, things like increasing opportunity in Elliott Bay and the Duwamish, um, increasing ch uh, chum opportunity in area 10 and 11, um, in October and November, um, the area 10 and 11 alignment to start in the in the winter. Um, so that's something that we have currently put into the season proposal. Um, area 11, more quota um, and more fishing days. And again, that's something that Derek will probably walk through in the modeling component in the next uh, little bit. We've heard about the Samish River Chinook snagging issues, um, and there have been some changes proposed to that fishery that we can talk through later if anybody's interested. Um, areas 10 and 11 aligning the summer fisheries to a June 1 start. They currently are both scheduled to start the same day. However, the area 10 Chinook fishery will be opening um, in July. Um, area 12 winter blackmouth we've heard about. Um, area 7 winter blackmouth we've heard about. Area 7 expanding the Bellingham Bay boundary. We've talked to some of you guys about that before. Um, areas 8.1 and 8.2 for winter blackmouth, um, an annual limit per angler, kind of similar to what is done in Alaska. Uh, we've heard about Baker Lake sockeye opportunities. And finally, we've heard about Minter Creek opening earlier for hatchery Chinook. So those are some of the feedback that we've heard thus far. Thank you, Kirsten. And uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to uh, turn the mic over to Derek Dapp a little bit. Uh, to walk us through some of the Chinook things that he's been looking at in the modeling. Uh, I'm going to, as I stated, I'm going to pull a, a modeling tool up on the screen here and share it uh, within the room. 
Uh, hopefully it's also going to be available online for those folks uh, who are interested in it. Where are you going to plug Great. So as we're getting this situated on screen now, um, as Mark mentioned, um, the uh, this tool should be available up on the North of Falcon uh, public meetings website. Um, hopefully folks can access there if they'd like to follow along or if they'd like to um, kind of start planning their own scenarios. But maybe as we're starting up uh, for folks who haven't used this tool before, um, uh, this is kind of uh, what we use in our public meetings to evaluate um, the impacts of uh, taking different fisheries actions, looking at different proposals folks have provided, um, and helping to shape our fisheries um, in terms of kind of meeting objectives for some of our key constraining stocks. Um, as we've been discussing, kind of one of our uh, main constraining stocks this year, as far as Chinook goes, um, is likely to be still Guamish. And you can see over here um, in this column C, um, this is uh, you, you can see right there, uh, currently, um, what we're going to be monitoring is the non-treaty mortalities on Stilaguamish. Um, each year, we try to evaluate what our objective will be for Stilaguamish. And um, I think kind of in the last public meeting, we thought that the range of available Stilaguamish mortalities might be somewhere between 80 and 100. At this time, we still haven't updated northern fisheries in the modeling, although um, uh, we are getting those northern fisheries today, and those should be updated very soon. Um, Anyway, um, from our preliminary looks, um, it's looking like the number of available Stilaguamish mortalities will probably be around 92, 93. Currently in our middle ocean option modeling exercise, um, you can see in row five here, um, uh, coming out of that initial model run, and maybe if we could expand column B and make it just a little bit larger, Mark. You can see that kind of the starting um, exploitation rate, starting um, mortalities coming up for Stilaguamish is uh, 99.7 for the non-treaty. So given that kind of um, through this process, uh, at the end, I expect this to be somewhere around 92 or 93. What I'd like to look at kind of in our modeling tool today um, is trying to look at kind of a proposal that gets us to somewhere, um, uh, a few different benchmarks, maybe looking at a proposal that gets us around 95 mortalities, maybe a proposal that gets us around 93 mortalities, and maybe a proposal that gets us uh, to, to 90 mortalities. That way we're considering kind of depending on how northern fisheries shake out and how uh, ocean fisheries and how other pieces fall into place, we have potentially a range of options that we could be looking at. Now, Kind of as we were going through the the starting presentation, I did mention that there's another uh, um, a kind of a number of other stocks that currently aren't meeting their management objectives. I think um, as we're kind of going through and crafting what we do for Still Guamish, um, it would be really wise of us to also be looking at some of the other key stocks that that might be constraining this year, particularly uh, Nisqually, um, Snohomish, Skokomish, and Nooksack Springs. Um, if we kind of aren't paying attention to those stocks as we're going through and crafting our modeling exercises, I do think it's very likely that we could get to the end of the process and have to make additional changes to fisheries um, to benefit those stocks because we would we would be not meeting our objectives. So that's kind of um, as we go through this tool, um, we can look across the different columns over here um, in columns D through G. We have kind of those those secondary stocks that we'll be looking at. Um, in column H, there's another metric that we're going to be paying attention to, which is kind of how the changes we make, how that affects the total Puget Sound um, sport catch. Um, and, and, and so that's kind of another column that we could be monitoring. 
um, column J, um, which isn't incorporated in that top bit, but if folks were interested, uh, we had kind of a suggestion in one of our last public meetings about being able to evaluate each of these um, actions that we're potentially taking and looking at kind of the Stiligwamish mortalities per quota, a way of kind of um, seeing how expensive in terms of quota each of those actions potentially is on Stiligwamish. So if folks are interested, um, uh, kind of in that far column J is where they could find that. And as we go through the proposals, we can look at kind of um, the impacts from each area and time period there. One thing that folks might notice that um, we haven't incorporated in this tool for this time around, um, but was requested last time was looking at um, angler trips. And I have to be upfront, um, I kind of ran out of time to, to, to examine that. But um, I, I do recognize it kind of as an important piece to be looking at and considering as we're shaping fisheries. So what, what I did do instead is you can see that there's a tab at the bottom, if you could go to Mark, called trips. Um, and we did kind of compile um, for the, the data from 2022 intensive monitoring, uh, looking at kind of the estimates of total angler trips for kind of um, each season and each area um, and looking at kind of the number of days open. So you could kind of get a metric of average angler trips per days open. So um, hopefully this can kind of help us to, um, uh, if folks are interested in kind of um, maximizing trips, this might be something that we could look at to help us with doing that. And I see a lot of squinting eyes out in the crowd. Um, so I, I do apologize once again, if, if, uh, if you do have your own computer device, you could, you could download the file there to look at it, or it looks like Mark is helping to blow it up. So, um, so once again, maybe if we can go back to the, the, the main tool tab, Mark, um, what I was thinking um, is that um, I just kind of uh, give a demonstration of how the tool works and then walk through each marine area, some of the thoughts that we've been having, um, looking at some of the proposals that folks have proposed and seeing if we can then once again, um, uh, take a look at potential options to shape it, getting down from around 100 still Guamish mortalities to once again, those benchmarks of 95, 93 and 90. Um, so basically how the tool works um, is um, in each of the rows um, and they're um, separated by area and time period, what you could do is you could um, put an X in the row and that's simple, uh, that, that signifies taking that action. So you can see on screen now uh, what, Mark, um, what, what Mark has there, that, that action is representing in Marine Area 5 summer, retaining last year's effort. Um, and you can see that the quota that produces uh, 4125 and then uh, closing salmon for fishing July 1st to August 15th. That's the main kind of Chinook retention period. And then opening Chinook during the same period that coho happens. Um, the reason why we could potentially get a modeling benefit from that particular action and the reason why we were looking at it is because then we wouldn't have to model Chinook non-retention encounters. And um, just uh, for that one action in particular, um, I do recognize that that's a very unpopular one. That's not one that we've heard as much interest from the public, but it is, you know, we're just looking at different range of options here and seeing what potentially could make sense. Um, so um, maybe if you scroll up, Mark, to, roll, to, to, to row 11, um, the one thing in here is that there is kind of a coming update that we know is going to happen. Um, right now, what's represented in the modeling is uh, test fishing impacts from 2022, and we are going to update those to represent kind of our planned test fishing for 2023. Um, if we scroll across the metrics, it has an, an extremely minimal update on our effect on kind of all of the modeling, but uh, just keeping in mind as we're going through the exercise, I would recommend checking that box right off the beginning. Um, so maybe um, maybe um, we could walk through each marine area and uh, talk a little bit about kind of um, what we've heard and what we've been thinking, what we've been seeing for each marine area, just kind of some important considerations before we actually start diving into proposals. And maybe starting with marine area five uh, in the summer and winter, I think Marine Area 5 is uh, a place where we've seen a lot of growth in recent years. Uh, kind of in one of the last meetings, we uh, spent a lot of time kind of highlighting the effort changes that we'd seen in Marine Area 5, especially in the winter time. And what we've currently got in the modeling, um, at least from what we're seeing, is um, uh, kind of a quota that is unlikely to make it through a full summer and winter season as planned. So one of the problems with Marine Area 5 is it's really difficult to increase the impacts there because um, of the recent growth. It's, it's led to being one of the areas that has the most impacts on Stiligwamish. One thing that we really are interested in, and you can see kind of highlighted there in that row 20, um, and Angelica and Kirsten spoke to it a little bit earlier, but we're really interested in building in some uh, non-retention impacts on Chinook uh, for, uh, for winter in Marine Area 5, the October period from October 1 through 15. As we kind of make those changes to 
um, benefit and, and provide coho opportunity, we got to make sure that we're aligning that with Chinook. And you can see that that, um, that does have a small increase on our Stiligwamish mortalities of 0.3, um, but once again, uh, relatively small kind of in the, in the grand scheme of things. Moving on to Marine Area 6. Um, Marine Area 6 is interesting because um, it has a very low number of Stiligwamish impacts um, in the summertime relative to adjacent marine areas. Um, it also has, uh, surprisingly maybe, uh, really low impacts on Snohomish, Nooksack Springs, and Nisqually. Um, um, where Marine Area 6 is really expensive is actually uh, Skokomish is, is where we see kind of uh, pretty high impacts on from that fishery. So the quota for Marine Area 6 in the summer uh, in the model right now is extremely healthy. It's approximately um, 8,800 fish. Um, uh, and that's, uh, for, for reference, that's 3,500 fish greater than the next largest quota for any marine area. So um, even though the impacts uh, on Stiligwamish per catch are relatively low in Marine Area 6, the key questions to consider for that area are basically how it impacts Skokomish, and if the reductions uh, to summer there make more sense uh, than uh, kind of other air marine areas that have maybe less robust quotas. Um, the downside to making changes in Marine Area 6 is that the other secondary constraining stocks, Nisqually, Skokom uh, Snohomish, and, and Nooksack Springs, don't really receive much of a benefit from changes in that area. Um, and then, of course, the secondary downside is because the Stiligwamish impacts are pretty low per catch, um, that um, you have to make relatively large changes to quotas um, to, um, uh, uh, to have much of an effect on the Stiligwamish uh, uh, mortalities. And you can kind of see that demonstrated in some of the actions there. And what Mark has, for example, in row 23, we see that if we were to um, uh, use the preseason effort from uh, 2022 uh, to represent Marine Area 6, it would drop that quota down by about 2,400 fish, but in doing so, it only reduces the Stiligwamish mortalities by 1.8. So relatively low change for a, a pretty large quota change. Moving on to Marine Area 7. Marine Area 7 is uh, one of the ones that tends to have the highest impact um, on Stiligwamish fish per quota caught. Um, and uh, the season, but the seasons for Marine Area 7 have been drastically reduced um, in, um, from what they were in kind of the late 2010s uh, due to both a combination of needing to meet Stiligwamish management objectives and increasing effort. So we've heard kind of um, uh, a lot of ideas uh, from the public on Marine Area 7. And I guess maybe to um, uh, just go over three of the ones that we've heard most consistently um, is looking for ideas to increase quota during the summer time period. Um, finding impacts to have a small winter fishery, maybe something that ranges between three and 15 days, um, and uh, increasing size limits for a benefit for um, Stiligwamish. And maybe I'll start on the size limits. Um, this is something that we'd kind of spoken to a little bit in our meeting, our public meeting last Thursday, but after um, internal consideration, um, I don't think that um, for this year we're going to be proposing any size limit changes for Marine Area 7. And uh, after internal consideration, kind of our, our, our thought there um, was um, actually because there's a lot of focus on Marine Area 7 um, uh, due to their overlap with Southern resident killer whales. And um, for Southern resident killer whales, um, from the literature that's come out, there is a size preference for uh, consuming uh, larger fish. Um, and um, so targeting those larger fish in our, in, in, in our fishery um, uh, was of concern internally and could also additionally be of concern uh, to NOAA. Each year we do uh, uh, put out a letter kind of uh, speaking to our fisheries and the impacts on southern resident killer whales, and there's been a lot of interest um, in marine area seven uh, there and our effects. Um, maybe, uh, maybe on the bright side, um, kind of on the summer quota, um, we, um, we have in the last set of model runs um, and hearing kind of feedback from our meeting two Wednesdays ago, we did in our, in our set of model runs currently bolster that summer quota a little bit. Um, we, um, we increased it from a quota last year of 1,800 fish to what we have currently in the modeling is uh, 2,181. Um, once again, it can be quite expensive to increase that quota, um, but we did want to dedicate kind of a few Stiligwamish impacts to that, given kind of the decreases that have happened in recent years. Um, I think the the winter fishery bit is something that we that's a little bit tricky, and we've been um, we've been considering that. You'll see that there are kind of a few different modeling proposals here that we could potentially look at and talk about. 
Um, the winter fishery is um, expensive on Stiligwamish, um, but kind of one of the other things that there's a few different considerations I think that we have on the winter fishery. Um, the first is that um, is that um, uh, the effort has changed a lot in our winter fisheries that have remained open in recent years. We do see kind of the amount of catch that you need to have modeled for marine areas 5, 10, and 11 um, as uh, uh, to run a full season is much greater um, in 2022 than, uh, than it was kind of in just a few years prior. So um, kind of as we're thinking about what the right approach is, we want to make sure that we have sufficient impacts available to be able to, to, to run this fishery. Um, if we, uh, there's a concern that if we were to overshoot our impacts, um, we are looking at um, having a Stiligwamish payback model, um, and it could impact us in fishing in future years. So kind of um, as we're thinking about a winter fishery, if we were to have, uh, say, um, uh, it would be uh, very nice to have a larger quota there, but if we did have kind of a, a relatively small quota, uh, we'd want to think about strategies there about how that might work, say maybe one day opening um, and then closing it down, evaluating the impacts. And then once we know if we have impact available, opening it again. Um, obviously, kind of um, uh, we have kind of um, uh, two different proposals here. One is pretty conservative, um, looking at kind of a, quite a large buffer to what we'd seen in the last uh, few years that the winter seasons were open in Area 7. Um, you can see that that's that option one in row 37 on screen now. And we have something that was actually proposed by Pat Patillo, which is looking at a quota of 600 in Marine Area 7. Um, and, um, and that, of course, um, has fewer impacts, but is uh, kind of a smaller quota. So if we were to look at something like that, just kind of some considerations is that um, if we were to look at Marine Area 7 in the summer as a surrogate from last year, in the first three days, we caught uh, over 800 Chinook. Um, and um, there would definitely be a lot of excitement around kind of a, a, a winter fishery. So once again, you know, thinking about strategies that that could make that work, uh, I think would be good. One other thing I think that's of consideration is when we have these very short openers is we have to think about kind of um, in, in halibut, we've seen when there's short select day openers, uh, um, people have gone fishing in days of bad weather, um, which is uh, sometimes resulted in people taking uh, risks to participate in a fishery. So I think that's something that we've heard from the public as well that we're, that, that we're also thinking about. Um, moving on to uh, Marine Area 9, maybe. So, um, so Marine Area 9 is one of the areas that's historically had a larger impact on Stiligwamish and is like Area 7 has also seen more restrictions in recent years. Um, other than using last year's effort to update the quota in this year's abundances, um, uh, Kind of, we see a change. Uh, um, we, we saw a change in this set of model runs from a quota of 4,700 to 4,875. So a, a small increase. We haven't made any changes to Marine Area Seven otherwise in the modeling. Um, and just to be clear, um, that number of uh, 4,875. Uh, we don't know uh, that that it seems like it'd be a little bit low for a sufficient quota to run a full uh, season for seven days a week. Just to be upfront about that. Moving on to Marine Area 10. So uh, Marine Area 10 was one where we actually uh, had a pretty healthy quota increase uh, in the last set of model runs. And we actually think that based off the catch per day information, what we've got in the modeling for the summertime um, might be sufficient to uh, hopefully make it through a full season. Um, the area has a pretty healthy quota right now in the modeling of about um, 5,200, which uh, if that catch were realized, it would be a greater catch than, um, than has been observed in Marine Area 10 in the summer in the last decade. So uh, once again, quite a healthy quota there. Um, Marine Area 10, like Marine Area 6, is one that has fairly low impacts on Stiligwamish per model catch. Um, but the difference with Marine Area 6 is that Marine Area 10 does have pretty significant effects on both Nisqually and, and Snohomish. Um, so um, as we're kind of thinking about the modeling tool, um, when we think about kind of potentially reductions in Marine Area 10, uh, they might make sense because the quota is pretty healthy compared to some marine areas and uh, reductions for Stiligwamish there might help us to benefit um, Snohomish and Nisqually um, on, on uh, you know, stocks that are of concern there. Um, one other just quick note about Marine Area 10 is uh, we have heard kind of comments from the public that um, what we've got modeled in the winter right now, um, it's, there's been early closures for the past few years, it's relatively low, so we do have some options to look at here um, about um, uh, kind of 
what it would cost to bolster that quota a little bit in the winter time. So the last one I wanted to speak to um, was Marine Area 11. Um, and Marine Area 11 was one where we um, um, uh, potentially had a little bit more flexibility due to low impacts on Stiligwamish. Um, starting with the winter, I think we heard from the constituents that there may be value to aligning the winter seasons um, with other open marine areas. Originally, we were kind of discussing potentially looking at March and April in marine areas 10, 11, and 5. And what folks might notice in um, in the current set of model runs is that we, we, we kind of um, uh, we have shifted the season for Marine Area 11 to align with Marine Area 10, which hopefully can help to disperse the effort between those two areas. Uh, both of those are scheduled between February and March. Um, for the summertime, we um, there, there's kind of two periods in Marine Area 11 that we look at for the summertime. There's this, the June specific period, and then there's the greater summer period between July and September. Um, and um, kind of as we were thinking about how we might bolster those quotas, keeping in mind that the June fishery was only open last year for uh, three days in a scheduled 30 day season. Um, we, uh, we, we, we did bolster both areas, but we increased the, the, the June period by about 800 fish and the July to September quota by about 600 fish relative to what it was last year. Um, and once again, that, that's our thought is that that, that June period uh, might have needed a little bit more uh, bolstering. However, we, we did kind of receive some public feedback, particularly, I don't know if he's on the line today or, or listening in, um, but from uh, Mr. Mark Oberlotz, um, who, um, who said that um, there might not be much desire in, um, in having that June fishery and that what might be a better use of impacts on Stiligwamish for Marine Area 11 is uh, closing down that June fishery and, um, and taking the Stiligwamish impacts from there and placing them into July to September. So you can see that that is an option that, that we can uh, uh, implement in the tool. Row 55 is closing Marine Area 11 in June. And then you can see that if you scroll down just a little bit more, Mark, uh, row 59, add quota to Marine Area 11 in July to September. That represents the equivalence of closing uh, Marine Area 11 in June. And you can see how that affects the quota. Um, so one last comment about Marine Area 11 is that it is one that, um, that while it has relatively low impacts on Stiligwamish, uh, is um, a relatively hard hitter on Nisqually. So um, that's kind of a consideration as we're moving through the modeling tool. Um, I could, um, I, I could um, uh, start to throw kind of some scenarios on board that help us to get to that 95, 93, and 90 number uh, for the Stiligwamish mortalities, but maybe this is actually a really good time to take a pause and see if there's any questions or any thoughts on any of the um, uh, on any of the things that we've started discussing on the tool or the specific marine areas. Carl? Uh, yeah. Thanks, Derek. Um, I had a thought about this, it, you know, the summer Chinook quota in Marine Area 10, how, you know, we've been able to get this complete season has been wonderful um, in the summer. Um, and we built in a nice quota. I, I just kind of had a thought about, you know, as we get into late August and we have coho around and we have this, what was the summer quota was 5216. Yep. And um, I, I mean, what, what 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 would be the you know what what about the thought process of maybe taking that number and moving it down to something like 4400 for the summer quota and what kind of savings would that be on Stiligwamish and if you could use some of those you know impacts on the Stiligwamish to maybe bolster your winter fishery in area 10 you know by using you know this is kind of how north of falcon used to work you could you could kind of shift some of your impacts around within the same area to sort of manage your fishery with within the same area you know if we were to pretend or you know or imagine that maybe the co-managers didn't care how we used our impacts and we were just able to use the impacts to how we wanted you know to manage and create our fishery uh, within the within the uh, management plan, um, so so that was just one thing that kind of came to mind, and uh, you know I didn't I, I just kind of came to me just as as you were talking about this that you know we have made it through August quite a few times it, with that summer quota, and um, you know we do get into we got we have pinks we have coho so you know if we met that and the kings they it does get kind of tougher fishing for kings when you get into late august unless you're actually in elliott bay and you have an elliott bay bubble with a separate sort of you know in, um, managed 
encounter rate on those. So that, that's something that's not built into this tool, but it, it's just something that came to mind. Um, and then I, you know, I, I was listening to your comments, you know, about the, the larger Chinook and the Straits for the, for the killer whales. And, and it, you know, it made me think about some of the other areas that have 24 inch limits, you know, for commercial fisheries and sport fisheries out in the ocean. And I was kind of wondering why, you know, it's a big concern in area seven to have a 24 inch limit, but why isn't it a concern, you know, in those other fisheries? Those were my two comments and, uh, concern and uh, questions. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Um, and maybe um, maybe I'll start by speaking a little bit to the killer whale piece, and I'll, I'll get back to the marine area 10 after. Um, on the killer whale piece, um, I, I think it's no secret that, um, that there's uh, a lot of uh, concern, particularly around the marine area 7 area, because um, that is one of kind of their primary usage zones um, in, in the summer time period, which is why that might receive a little bit more scrutiny than, than, than other areas. Um, and um, and then maybe going to Marine Area 10, um, um, I guess what I would say there is we don't have something specifically in this modeling tool for 4,400, um, but um, even though it, it isn't exact, um, it, it, it is pretty linear. You could probably say, um, you know, for example, if you were to take half of that change that's in row one, you could probably say it would be about, you know, 0.85 um, would be the, the, the change to still Aguamish mortalities if you did half of that measure. So not very much. Um, not 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 very much, but the, the, it, it would be possible to look at a modeling exercise, and and you could probably game it out also using kind of the winter scenario below. You could probably game it out and see kind of uh, based off just um, uh, that linear look. You could probably see kind of what additional quota that might get you in marine area ten. Thank you and good morning. Um, Pat Patillo. I represent uh, the interests of not just my own interest in sport fishing and and the, the Puget Sound salmon resources, but uh, the Northwest Marine Trade Association, those interests in their boating and fishing, and also the Charter Boat Association of Puget Sound. So, um, I uh, really appreciate what you've done here uh, since the last meeting. It's, you know, it isn't always apparent in the interim um, what's going on with you guys, but I know you're darn busy. And uh, uh, so I, this this is a really pretty comprehensive list and it's gonna take, well, I'd love to grab the tool and, and uh, look at some of those things, but you've addressed uh, quite a few things that I thought were on, well, they were on the list of concerns or uh, from relative to uh, possible changes and uh, uh, both for Chinook and Coho. Uh, in particular, the I thought your your uh, Coho package, the I'll call it the updated package that the uh, more aggressive uh, response with to the request for consideration of the late season non-selective fishing. That's I really appreciate that. Uh, I was wondering uh, with Chinook, you've, you've answered a lot of the, some of the questions that I had uh, and clarifications. You've a, the list of issues that you're attempting to address are, is a good comprehensive list, even included CHUM, which I very much appreciate uh, in areas 10 and 11, especially. Uh, I note there on the CHUM topic that we did hear at the uh, uh, Puget Sound and Freshwater meeting uh, in Lacey, uh, some pretty optimistic views from the regional staff on the abundance returns of chum salmon, like particularly to the Green River. And so it does seem like there's some room for, at the very least, retention in coho fisheries, um, say uh, September and October in areas uh, 9, 10, uh, 11. Uh, I I would uh, support you know staying away from the deeper South Sound uh, terminal areas. I think that's a smart thing until in season supports that there are really the chum abundances. But there's 350,000 chum coming back to Central and South Puget Sound uh, Puget Sound areas and stocks, and I 
that's pretty healthy. I know individual stocks, some of them are, are more troubled, but uh, appreciate the consideration for at least retention, possibly non-retention, but allowing uh, fishing even in November. Uh, like to see what you have in uh, in mind regarding that. Uh, I, I uh, support what Carl was challenging about the uh, SRKW. I think it's really important for us to be addressing up front more what we're doing for SRKW. And it's not just during the winter or the summer, it's uh, just about everywhere, but also stepping back and seeing that the, the uh, impacts of our fisheries on large Chinook salmon is uh, one thing that is really missing, and or I'll add to Carl's point is that not only are there is the 24 inch size limit, I believe not really a targeting of large fish and, and resulting in an increase in large fish, but the large fish that SRKW consume with the studies that have shown that from DNA from their, their uh, uh, diet studies is that those are wild fish. Those are uh, Fraser fish, for example. And with Mark Selective Fisheries, the reduction, the release of wild fish goes a long ways in reducing dramatically the impact on Fraser River, Chinook in that area of, of Area 7, uh, especially. And if you look at the uh, CTCs, the Chinook Technical Committees, uh, PSC's uh, reports on exploitation rate changes, you'll see that Puget Sound sport is very, very low and not really even comparable to the impact on those large Chinook that are preferred prey by SRKW in the ocean fisheries and in those other fisheries that are non-selective. So I'll leave that uh, with you, those thoughts. Um, I, I'm sure that I do have more, but I won't take up any more time right now. Thank you very much. Leah, do we have anybody online with a question? I was just going to interject and say we have Tony on the line with a hand up. Tony, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, you muted, Tony. We could hear you. Uh, is there going to be a chump season on the Nooksack River this year for chums for Rex? I'm looking in the room here, Tony, to see if somebody, somebody, can, somebody answer can answer that answer question. That question. <clears throat> One second, somebody's, One second, coming, somebody's to the mic. coming to the mic. Morning, Tony. Morning, Tony. Morning. As far as, as uh, uh, the season, season for, for, for something, that something that we are, are considering, considering um, on, on the next this, this year. year. Uh, Sorry, hey, Tony, I muted you really quick. I want you to be back in the room. Um, I will unmute you. You can unmute again when you want to talk. Sorry about that, Tony. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Tony. Can you hear me? No, we can hear you. Um, can you hear me now? We got you, Tony. Um, if there is no season for the chums on the Nooksack River, I uh, feel and other people feel that uh, WDFW will be favoring the uh, tribal and non-tribal fleet. Um, we haven't had a season up here for years, and uh, I feel the Rex should have uh, a season too. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Um, um, we appreciate your, appreciate input. your input. Thank you. Brad, go ahead, Brad, and, come go ahead and come to the mic. Yeah, hi, my name is Brett Markdahl. 
I'm a avid sport angler. Um, something I'd promised I would talk to you every year about, Mark. I'd just like to point out that uh, there's one and only one area in Puget Sound that has no summer Chinook season, and that's area eight. Area eight also has no winter blackmouth season. Um, in an earlier version of this uh, tool, I saw that there was a season proposed or a potential season proposed for area eight in the winter time. Um, I think in the, the spirit of fairness, we should be discussing what we can do in area eight for some sort of Chinook season, since it's the only one that doesn't have uh, any kind of Chinook season at all. Um, even if it was something as simple as a short season in Area 8-1, I think the folks up in Area 1 would appreciate that discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Brent. Alex, go ahead. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, just to also back up on the point Carl and Pat had made, uh, agreed that Area 7 definitely holds the SRKWs to the greater ex extent of our marine areas, but the two other areas that they're also prevalent in is the Southern Gulf Islands of, of Canada, and then also uh, out on the in the Western Strait in Area 4. Um, both of those areas, we are seeing a 24 inch minimum on, on fish. So uh, Area 4 sees it, and so does Area 9-4. Uh, which would be the middle bank or the eastern strait portion of, of the southern Gulf Islands, they have a minimum of 17.7. They do have a max, a max fish on, on marked fish at 26 inches, but with that not being a selective fishery, um, they wouldn't see the impacts, or we wouldn't see the impacts that they see there. Um, and as well as 18-11, which is the north end of uh, Orcas Island, uh, there's a minimum size of 64 centimeters, which is 24 and a half inches. So they implement those size restrictions there without issue. So I would imagine that we could start looking at approaching the same. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. We heard uh, you, Pat and Carl, we'll, we'll take those points into consideration. Good morning. Good morning, Tom. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you guys. Tom Nelson, the Outdoor Line. A um, couple things. I haven't, I haven't heard anything with regard to specific dates for the Elliott Bay bubble. I'd like information on also the Tulalip fishery. Not really heard any specific dates there. Um, the Canadian regulatory issue is very, very interesting right now because right now, Canada's DFO is moving towards uh, mark selective management in house sound this year for the first time. So having similar size restrictions and reciprocation would, would be a very beneficial aspect to our overall management. If we're, if, if uh, DFO is moving towards mark selective, we move towards a 24 inch size limit. I, I, I agree with Papatillo's uh, take on this fishery where, you know, we're, we're, we're saving the correct, type of Chinook that we want to definitely back off of. Another thing is if, if, if we do have concurrent regulations, I just wonder when was the research done, the mark select, the, the tag recovery study that we currently base our management on it, it, in my understanding, it's decades old. So if the regulations are changing in DFO, I, I just wonder if there was, if there's any thought given to, reconducting this research by which we're managing our fisheries. I realize that's a, a big financial ask, but uh, given given the stake that we all have in these fisheries, I, I think I think it's a worthy thing. And then the my last question is, uh, does the potential for a stilly payback situation, does that work both ways? If if um, if the non-tribal fleet is is going to be asked to pay back or is there a provision for the tribes to also uh, bear the same burden so I, I realize that's a lot but i'll let you guys uh, chew on that 
So thank you. Things there, Tom. Um, so maybe I'll start us off, and then if Kirsten or Mark have any additional thoughts, that would be great. Um, maybe I'll start with uh, the easy one, uh, which is 8D and uh, 10A, um, Elliott Bay and sure. the Tulalip bubble. Yeah. Um, I think what we have in the modeling right now for those is uh, looking at recent year averages. We're looking at kind of the recent, the, the same seasons that we've had in recent okay. years. For uh, reference for anybody on the line who might be interested, uh, we had a season uh, between uh, uh, May 27th and September 25th last year for Tulalip. Okay. And then for Elliott Bay, I'd have to pull up the exact dates, but um, similar to last so year's placeholders, what okay. we'd be expecting. Yep. Um, and then um, as far as uh, kind of some of the Canadian regulations, um, uh, I'm not 100% um, familiar on the Canadian regulations. I want to go back and take a look at uh, what um, what Alex and others have have, have brought up. Um, one thing that is kind of a key difference with the Canadian regulations and matching things up is they, they do things very differently than us. They, they do have kind of slot limits where there is a maximum size as well that they that that they kind of can't keep in their fisheries. Um, that would be a very different change up for us if we were to kind of look at aligning some of those some, some of those regulations. Um, and then the last piece on the Siliguamish payback model, um, I guess I would say that um, uh, we're still kind of working out the details with co-managers on 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 how that looks and the implementation there. Um, uh, the idea, um, if if you wanted to, there is kind of some language about it in the 2022 uh, uh, management unit profiles that came out. There's language there that describes kind of the intention of that, and the intention is uh, for it to be for both sides. Okay, thank you. And then, what year were these tagging studies done that were that currently are driving your your tool, for instance? Ah, uh, thanks. That that was a that, that was the one I missed. Um, yeah. So, um, we did update. Um, so when we update what we call the base period, the sure. base period is what we use in our our modeling for Chinook. Um, and um, and uh, we actually had a pretty big victory. Uh, I think it was in 2017 when we updated it. Uh, where we updated it to using uh, tags from uh, uh, fishing years 2007 through 2013. Okay. Um, prior to that, it was using tags that dated all the way back to the 80s. So yeah. quite old at that point. And like I said, uh, a major victory for kind of moving things forward. Um, when we do these base period updates, there's uh, a large amount of information that goes into it. I, I think there's around 200,000 coded wire tags that we're using. Uh, when we update the base period, there is kind of a, a really long QAQC process that in some ways is still ongoing. We're still finding kind of corrections to what we produced back in 2017 and, and uh, fixing things up. When you have kind of that much data that's going into it, it's, it uh, there's, there's definitely a little bit of a lag on it. Sure. We are thinking kind of forward about kind of into the future, um, uh, and I'm not saying it's going to be next year, but we are thinking about what's the right timeline to implement those changes as to when we're updating the base period. That's something that we're discussing with the co-managers, but we do recognize that kind of, um, you know, as regulations change, as, as, as uh, people are potentially fishing in different areas, as there's area closures, that could impact what you're looking at in that base period. Then the, the last thought I through it, you would be similarly to W, um, excuse me, DFO has a, a citizen science aspect to a lot of what they do too. I'd really engage, um, encourage you guys to engage with a lot of us anglers that, that have decades and decades of experience on the water and the right kind of boats. And, and we would, there'd definitely be a cadre of, of us anglers that would assist you guys in such research if, if you have but to ask. So I know this is a busy time for you guys. I appreciate your time and efforts. Thank you very much. So just a quick follow-up. Um, so for the current Elliott Bay and Tulalip bubble, Tulalip is currently modeled from 526 through 95 for those uh, uh, Friday through Monday, and then 99 through 924 for the Saturday, Sunday. And for um, Elliott Bay, let me just scroll down. Um, it's currently modeled for 86 through 89, and then um, closed in the middle of August. And then we have that week open at the end for pink. And that is all um, on the website under the public input page under North of Falcon. Um, there's a recreational seasons there that we've been updating. So it is online. So if you want to check it out, but those are the dates. Yep. And it looks like Art has his hand up online. Art, go ahead. You have me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Um, first of all, thanks everyone. I, I wanted to be at that meeting in person today, but uh, uh, things didn't work out traffic and stuff wise. But anyway, um, first of all, this exercise feels a little premature. And why I say that, because we still don't have the final ocean numbers, Canadian numbers, or even the tribal numbers. 
And I know you, it, it, it's it's good to kind of get ahead of the game, um, but I just want to make sure everybody knows that. And so until those numbers come in, it's uh, it's going to be challenging over the next what couple of weeks. Um, there was a comment about Area 11 possibly closing in June. I would much rather see uh, leaving that area open and do the in-season management like we've uh, done before. It seems to work out really well, well, with the exception of last year, which I think was a, a rare occurrence of a lot of Chinook in one place at one time, or so it seemed. Um, so I'd rather, rather go that route if we can. I think it makes a lot more sense. Um, and also, June, were you having in Area 10, was there a coho fisheries? Um, I can't remember, um, but if that's uh, if that's going on, that should help take some pressure off the of, uh, area 11 as well. So thank you. Thanks, Art. The, the current proposed season for area 10 is a June 1st start. It would be coho only, uh, and that would be all the way through the summer. Uh, and then we would start Chinook fishing July 13th is what the current proposal is in area 10. That's right. Thank you. And Art, if it's all right, maybe if I could just speak for a moment to uh, the modeling. Um, so as far as the modeling goes, um, you are right um, that um, that right now we don't have the northern fisheries in. There's going to be different moving pieces that we're going to be looking out for. And that's kind of why um, when we were doing planning today, I wanted to look at a potential range of options, not knowing where we might land, land out 95, 93, 90. Um, um, because um, that might help uh, that might help to guide us knowing that um, that tonight we will probably get those northern fisheries and tonight we will probably do the modeling for those northern fisheries and we probably will um, it's not decided yet but we probably will look to do kind of a, a, a model run that updates uh, ha that has some updates to Puget Sound going into PFMC2 um, and so if that's the case we just want to have kind of a range of potential options available. Oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. It's best to have that, uh, you know, ammunition there and everything in place. It at least gives you a good idea of the moving parts and how to make it work. So I appreciate it. Hey, I'm Dan Cooper. I own uh, Possession Point Bait Company, commercial herring fisherman, and I let people fish on my beach. I'm just in. Eight two, about 200 yards north of area nine. And I let people fish my beach. I got a couple hundred feet. We haven't been able to fish kings since 1993 there. No summer kings. When's that gonna change? I mean, you can fish, hatchery fish right here. You can go to the rivers or go over to layout and keep, keep, keep anything. But my spot hasn't been able to fish a king since 1993. And that's when I started raising fish for the fish and wildlife. And then we stopped raising uh, coho. We weren't getting any back. They were all ending up in a cannery out here at uh, Port Angeles. So I stopped that too. When are we going to get a season? Or is there going to be ever a season again in my lifetime for a summer king in that area? I'm not sure that we have an answer to that question. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, given the the status of Chinook stocks in Puget Sound, I, I don't see it as a uh, uh, an expansion anytime in the near future. Right, but you can do it in Area 9. What are we expanding in Area 9? You, you can fish Kings there, Hatchery King. That's 200 yards from me. You're killing my bait company. And I don't know what to say else. You can keep anything at Tulalip. That's it. We have Tony with a hand up. Tony, go ahead. Tony, it looks like you're muted. We 
We cannot hear you, Tony. Okay, we're gonna go to Glenn. Tony, we'll try you again in a few. Glenn, go ahead. Good morning, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you. I got a question, Derek, in regards to the Chinook quotas in Puget Sound. You know, last year, the quotas went up and the majority of the areas, the area five, area five went down in quota. And at the time it was believed that we would have had enough quota to fish our season the way it was drafted. And of course we didn't. Um, then I look at the quotas now and I see again, quotas going up in some areas significantly. And we did go up a little bit, but it is still almost predicted that we won't be able to fish a full uh, 45 days for our Chinook. Um, can you uh, shed some light on that? Hey, Glenn. Um, so um, I just wanna say, um, I acknowledge that we had these conversations uh, last year um, and, um, and that as it turned out, uh, we did shut down Marine Area 5 early. We do have, as you mentioned, uh, a very uh, uh, small change to the quota for Marine Area 5 uh, this year, which is uh, using the same efforts, um, just based on abundance changes. Something that might be particularly of concern for Marine Area 5 that I've been looking at, that, that I, as I've been looking at it, is uh, Marine Area 5 does get some influence from uh, Columbia River Chinook. Um, and we know that the Columbia River Chinook are going to be up this year. So that's something that's um, um, a little concerning to me when I see the quotas. Um, um, I would say that kind of, um, we, we have seen, um, even though I know you're speaking particularly to the summer, we have seen kind of an increase in the winter period. We have seen kind of an increase in the, uh, Chinook quota that we've had over the past few years, uh, particularly during that winter period. Um, and, um, and, um, I, I think that there's, I, I think that you're right. I think that there's a good chance that, uh, with the quota that we've got modeled, uh, both for the summer and the winter in Marine Area 5, I think it's, uh, likely to result in early closure. But, um, but from what I'm seeing right now in the modeling, um, is we are quite limited on Stiligwamish impacts from where we're at in the modeling overall. Um, it's likely that we're going to have to make reductions from where we're at, uh, not have um, not have increases. And one of the one of the pieces that um, I think that I've been looking at, um, in addition to um, uh, kind of the uh, uh, how expensive Marine Area Five is on the Stiligwamish impacts per quota increase, the other thing that I've been looking at is um, is uh, kind of Marine Area Five um, and the overall impacts on Stiligwamish versus some other areas. From what I'm seeing right now, um, uh, Marine Area 5, when you combine both the summer and the winter, is the, the marine area that has the most Stiligwamish impacts out of any of our marine areas. But is that data from years ago, or are you referring to recent years? Uh, I'm looking particularly at, at what we have in the modeling for, for this year. And certainly if you were to look at years ago, um, that distribution might look a little, that distribution might look a little different. Um, I, um, uh, I, I think historically is kind of, there's been changes to Marine Area 7 and Marine Area 9, um, Marine Area 6 as well in the winter time. Um, I think we've seen the, where those areas historically had a larger impact on Stiligwamish, uh, those impacts have gone down. I think for Marine Area 5, what's been particularly expensive is the winter fishery. Um, if we look at the tool, um, Mark, and if you um, maybe scroll up to Marine Area 5 winter, um, and if you scroll to the right on the Stiligwamish impacts per quota, um, you can see that that, um, that number right there, it might not look like much, that 0 0.009, but if you compare that to other areas, um, that's just as expensive as Marine Area 7 in the summer per quota. Um, and that is one of our more expensive areas that we've got. Um, Mark, um, I, think I, I think I did send through kind of a, a graphic that we might want to look at um, to your teams, but, if, if you could pull that up real fast. Now, we realize that Area 5 is definitely getting more expensive, but is that because of angler effort change because of the other areas being closed? Um, so that there, there is a very good chance that, that that plays into this as we've kind of kept Marine Area 5 in the winter open. And sorry, um, Mark, if you could just maybe blow that up. Um, you can see right here, 
Um, this is the distribution of still, I was looking at this last night. This is what's currently in the modeling exercise. You can see the distribution of still Aguamish mortalities in Puget Sound sport fisheries. You can see kind of over here, um, the colors represent the season. And if you scroll, sorry, Mark, if you scroll down just a little bit so that we can see the areas, there we go. Um, you can see that Marine Area 5, uh, that, that winter season is really expensive. Um, so that's, um, and, and to get back to your question about kind of why we, why we see that change, I think historically when we were kind of, um, um, you know, a few years ago when we were making a larger cuts to our winter fisheries for Stiligwamish, we, we saw that Marine Area 5 was a relatively small area with a relatively kind of uh, modest quota. Um, which kind of um, we, we've seen that kind of modeled in recent years and and uh, executed, but kind of as we're moving as we're moving forward and that fishery is growing potentially due to uh, changes in effort, as you highlighted, uh, um, um, Glenn, potentially due to kind of uh, what areas are closed and what areas are open. Uh, we have seen kind of the impacts, particularly from that fishery increase. I'm going to pull open something real fast just so I can speak to it, but um, historically kind of. Um, in that area, if we were to look, say, at, uh, say, 2010 through 2019, the average catch in that fishery was um, 591. Um, we don't have kind of the finalized estimates for 2021 yet, but in March, we caught over 3,000 fish there. So. Okay, I appreciate that, Derek. If there's not another hand in the room, we have another hand online. Uh, go ahead. Tony, Tony, go ahead. Can you hear me on my phone? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, this is regarding uh, Nooksack tanks this year. Um, does the quota or the encounters of pinks um, going to affect the uh, commercial days in Bellingham Bay and the tribal uh, days in the Nooksack River. With a uh, low return of Nooksack pinks of only 24,000. So here's what I think I know, and I'm looking to the back of the room uh, to Ed Eliezer to confirm or refute what I'm about to say. Uh, what I think I know, Tony, is that there will be no directed pink opportunities in Bellingham Bay commercially this year. We try to control that through mesh size in our fisheries, and, and uh, we're not directing any of those opportunities in the bay at pink salmon. Uh, I think uh, uh, at a recent co-manager meeting, um, the the tribes uh, uh, talked to us about um, potential fisheries and indicated that they were likely not to do directed pink fisheries uh, in the in the mouth or in the river, um, just given the the low uh, expected return this year. Um, but maybe I'll pause and see if Ed if I got something wrong or if Ed wants to to jump in here. Now you got that right, Mark. <clears throat> Lummi Nation and the Nooksack Indian Tribe will not have any directed fisheries on pink salmon this year. Well, what I would like to see happen, a lot of others, is uh, that six days uh, of gill netting going on below the Marietta Bridge there every year. Um, you know, they got coho in the mix there too, but uh, I think that that should be reduced on days. Um, till uh, the uh, pink salmon get up to the mouth of the North Fork River where they're heading to spawn. So I think there needs to be a reduction in days there um, or the tribes are gonna have to increase their mesh size and fish for Chinook uh, while the pinks move up river. Thanks, Tony. We appreciate your input and we'll take that back. Thank you. And we have another question online. If you don't have another one in the room, Mark. Uh, we do, but go ahead and take the one online and then we'll go to the one in the room. Okay, and Kirsten, did you have something? 
Yeah, real quickly, I just wanted to uh, correct something I said before I, for the dates for the Elliott Bay fishery. It should be the weekend opener in the beginning of August should be 8-4 through 8-7. And then it should be about that last two weeks in August uh, for the pink opening. So I misspoke on that earlier. Apologies, we are getting it corrected online. So I just wanted to, to kind of let everybody know that those are the correct dates now. So that's it. Thank you, Kirsten. And our next hand is from Gabe. Gabe, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate the opportunity. It's uh, fortunate I couldn't be there today, but it's nice to at least have a Zoom option be able to get on. Um, wanted to talk about Area 11. Um, I hate, hate to see anything cut, but it looks like we're uh, you know going to have to make some decisions here at some point. So I've um, been text messaging and had a couple calls with some constituents out at Area 11 here in the last half hour. And uh, the general consensus I'm hearing is that we really want to keep at least some opportunity in June as much as possible. That was a really popular fishery last year. Um, it, historically, it was really popular when it was open pre-2018. And when you look at the impact that it has on Stilly, it's relatively low compared to a lot of other areas. So um, yeah, would like, like to see some opportunity there and not have, have June go away completely. Thank you. Thanks, Gabe. And that was our last hand online for right now. I think Pat had a question in the room. Thanks, Mark. Um, I don't have a question, Pat Patillo again, and I'm not really trying to keep up with Tony. Gee, um, but uh, I did want to make a comment uh, that's, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, it's more general. Uh, this is about the value of Mark Selective Fisheries um, to co-management. Uh, I've had a lot of history on this. Um, I've just had a lot of history, probably too much. Um, Fair sharing and allocation is sometimes brought up, um, you know, that it's <laughs> that it isn't so fair or we're not sharing or how are we sharing. But I I really think that the Puget Sound Chinook, still a Guamish Chinook issue of allocating uh, equally, uh, that is the, has been the, I uh, dare I say the policy, um, uh, of the last two two years, and it is again this year. I think these to to balance the impacts. It's it's actually a, a pretty good example of how uh, we should be addressing fair sharing between tribal and non-tribal fisheries, which is really at the heart of the Puget Sound salmon management plan um, and it's the heart of the north of falcon process um, do you know that uh, it's been 50 years since the bolt decision it's been 40 years to this year since the very first north of falcon meeting that i, I just happened to attend that one too and <laughs> i've been to too many meetings but it was interesting that at that meeting uh, you often have heard Lorraine Loomis, and, and God bless her, and uh, uh, that, that she always spoke to addressing the needs of fisheries. And I think that uh, I'll just recall her, because uh, she often uh, would um, um, do, yeah, do, pretty much do like this to me. Uh, and remind me of that it's important to address the needs, that it's not strict allocation. And I, I really uh, had come to believe that and understand it and really think that it's important. And I think the Mark Selective Fisheries that we use is an important example. And here it is, it was still a Guamish. Um, this year, there are more natural fish, it's, it's about two to one, 
um, of Stiligwamish fish, and they're they're pretty much they're controlling um, a lot of our impacts, as you've repeatedly um, pointed out to the to us, and it's very true. But it's interesting if you look at the non-treaty fishery, mostly sport impacts versus the tribal impacts. It's a very different outcome when you apply the 14% limit to the hatchery stock, uh, though it's less abundant than the nine and the 9% limit to the natural stock, it turns out that there's actually more hatchery fish that are harvestable than there are natural fish. And if you then realize that they're just swimming around together um, and you look at the modeling results then the tribal fisheries that uh, that take Stiligwamish have Stiligwamish Im impacts, they're catching slightly more natural fish than hatchery fish. And the because the sport fisheries are marked selective, they're catching about two to one hatchery impacts to wild impacts of Stiligwamish. Well, okay, what how does that work out then? If you have equal sharing, but you have flexibility built into that, and you provide the tribes fisheries with, you reach an agreement that has more of the share of the wild fish for the tribal fisheries and more of the hatchery share than 50% for the sport fisheries, then you can maximize the catch of all of the harvestable Stiligwamish fish. Now, why is that really interesting? It's because it's the best outcome that we can expect. And uh, a lot of people might think, well, why are we, we, we doing this, um, giving the tribes more than 50% of the natural fish? Well, <laughs> it's, it, it's gonna give us the most hatchery fish more than the tribes of the impacts on Stille, but along with that, because we're fishing in all of the mixed dock areas of Puget Sound, we're able to maximize our catch of the hatchery fish that are out there for our harvest enjoyment. And that's really a good thing. So it's kind of like a little tidbit, but what's important about it is that <laughs> Mark selective fisheries benefit all of our fisheries. It benefits the tribes. It produces a lot of fish for the, the tribes. It, it effectively maximizes our catch. And this year it's a, uh, you know, we'll wait and see what the final outcome is, but I think it's gonna be a pretty good example of how that balance and the flexibility and allocation benefits our fisheries. Thank you very much. That wasn't a question. Thanks for the comment, Pat. So Leah, do we have any hands raised online? And if not, um, maybe it might be a good uh, idea to maybe walk through some modeling tool scenarios. Maybe. Nope, we don't have anybody online right now. Perfect. So not seeing any hands in the room. Um, uh, keeping in mind that uh, right now, um, uh, what we're looking at is potentially uh, some options that get us to a range of potential Stiligwamish mortalities. Um, and as, um, as we've been thinking about it, there's a lot of different uh, potential uh, ways that we could take this. Um, Mark already has kind of the box checked for the X in row 11. Mark, if I could also have you scroll down to Marine Area 5 winter and check the box. Oh, you already you already have for the coho fishery there in October um, 1 through 15. And then if we also check the box in Marine Area 6 for the same, if you haven't already. So you can see kind of in the post-action ERs at the top with those few changes, uh, it would put us up by uh, a small amount of Stiligwamish mortalities. We're just over 100. Um, looking at potential options to uh, get down to 95 at first, 
um, kind of, um, uh, and just throwing something on the table here, um, what we could think about um, is looking at Marine Area 10 uh, in the summer first. And if we scroll down, Mark, to Marine Area 10, um, uh, maybe uh, checking that box in row 47 um, might be, um, and, and the reason why that might be um, an action that makes sense as a first action um, would be um, because we do know that the, the quote is pretty healthy for Marine Area 10. This puts us back down to the preseason effort um, um, from last year. And Marine Area 10 was one of the ones that tended to stay open longer last year for a season. As we look, kind of look across at the other stocks, one of the really big things that we're considering here, in addition to the healthy quota that it currently has, is we're also considering um, the, the effect that it has on Snohomish um, and Nisqually, uh, two stocks that if we aren't kind of cognizant about and thinking about as we make changes um, are likely to still wind up being constrainers once we make the changes we need to for Stiligwamish. Um, so you can see that um, it has a benefit to both of those stocks there and relative to other options, um, it, it's uh, uh, not, a, not, not a bad one. Um, if we move up to Marine Area 6, and for a lot of the same reasons in the summertime, we could check the box in row 23. Um, that still leaves us with a pretty healthy quota. It would still be the largest quota um, in Puget Sound, that's 6,300. Um, you can see that the effect on Stiligwamish mortalities um, is, uh, once again, not that great. It's only about, it's only about two Stiligwamish fish, and particularly for the marine sport catch that goes down, it's quite a big change. Um, this one doesn't have as big of an effect on Snohomish, Nisqually, and Nooksack Springs as the Marine Area 10 change or other changes that we could potentially make, but where it really does benefit is Skokomish. Um, it's kind of the most impactful change that we could potentially make on Skokomish. Um, and you can see that that puts us down to 96.9. Um, another thing that we could look at, once again, particularly thinking about Nisqually now, is uh, moving down to Marine Area 11. And if we check uh, both the box uh, row 54 in June, and then in the July to September period, row 58, and then we take a look at what that does, that's, that could get us to our 95. Um, so that would be reverting kind of a lot of the, um, the, um, the potential increases that we looked at uh, kind of in our meeting two Wednesdays ago, um, recognizing that kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, we don't know where the northern fisheries or ocean fisheries are going to land, but also recognizing that we want kind of a clear plan to help us get to some of these objectives. These would not, uh, these would not be decreases in effort or quota that was proposed for last year. These are once again solely things that we had uh, we had looked at potentially increasing for this round of modeling. Um, and I want to see maybe uh, before moving on to 93 and 90, uh, see if there's kind of any comments or feedback uh, on on that proposal. We do have a hand online, Derek. We have a hand from Robert. Robert, go ahead. So I raised my hand with a different question than what Derek just asked. So I don't know if you want to finish where Derek was and then come back to me or if you want me to bring up my question. I don't see any hands raised in the room here, Rob. So if you want to go with your question now, that's perfect, I think. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could show again What's the highest area of impact on our stilly fish? Um, and I was I was thinking, I don't remember what the number was, but it looked like it was pretty high up in area five. And I was curious if we had looked at, you know, the, the weather, I know they had issues with docks and wind and different things. I know the early season, um, everybody loves CQ, but I wondered if those impacts, some of those impacts might be better used where we have higher angler trips at that time of year. Thanks, Rob. Um, and so your question on uh, Stiligwamish uh, impacts uh, per uh, per quota, um, and we could check this in column J, but my recollection is uh, Marine Area 5 in the winter, Marine Area 7 in the summer are two of the highest, um, as well as one that kind of shook out as surprising to me, which was Marine Area 11 in the winter. Um, uh, that, 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 was a, that was kind of, once again, a, a little bit of a weird result, but um, I think that's what I saw as I was doing the modeling. Okay, well, maybe we should look at modeling some of those to keep our, our, our June um, down where we have a really high number of um, angler trips 
in area 11. Um, just a thought. I really appreciate that, Rob, because actually, um, as I was um, uh, kind of getting into some of these modeling exercises, and I was thinking about which changes are the ones that could make the most sense for Stillaguamish, one of the places where I had initially looked was looking at Marine Area 5 in the winter, just recognizing that there's been kind of an increase in effort in recent, in recent years. Um, the reason why um, I wasn't uh, initially putting that kind of in the proposal that we have on screen um, and uh, uh, as a spoiler alert, when uh, when we look at 93 and 90, it's one of the things that I was thinking about. Um, but um, the, the reason why I didn't put that in the initial to get down to 95 is once again, concern for Nisqually particularly, but also Snohomish and Skokomish and, 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 um, uh, and Nooksack Springs. Just realizing that kind of in some of the preliminary modeling that I've done, um, uh, uh, we could, if we took all of our changes uh, uh, for Stillaguamish, say, in Marine Area 5 in the winter, um, okay. then we would still have problems on these other stocks and likely still have to make Marine Area changes, and that's not a good place to be, and I don't think. I just wondered if it was an area where we could take some to, to help without hurting anybody too much. Thank you for what you're doing. It's been good. You've listened to a lot of input this year. Um, uh, Pat Patillo again. Um, now I can see the screen. I, that's the only reason why I you know, raised my hand. No, just kidding. Um, but really, it's it's pretty hard to follow, Derek. I I think I I, I get where you're going with these things. You're showing. Um, possibilities here uh, and you're really trying to develop those possibilities but I, it's really hard I think for anybody to understand how things are changing because we can't see the numbers and things are are, are moving and um, if we had the tool uh, uh, ourselves and could look at it at the same time you're looking at it it'd be really helpful but so I, I think you're you you please don't uh, misinterpret the lack of questions here as being lack of questions. Um, I, I noticed in the I'll recall back to the previous modeling and that there was a, a pretty big difference in how uh, area by area things were added. And um, uh, for example, area six and and a big increase, as you remarked this morning, and that was a good clarification. And you, uh, I think, completed the thought by uh, reminding people that the reasons that you did that were, it's very relatively low impact on Stillaguamish. Um, it has a high uh, catch, uh, or excuse me, um, angler participation and catch. Uh, and so it's it's a good place to utilize impacts, uh, but what I would prefer myself to come at is uh, this problem is, are there any places where the risk, and that's hard to, to, to measure, the risk of, of having an in-season um, emergency is heightened or from our recent experience, because most recently, We've had a lot of those experiences you have, we've enjoyed together, um, kiddingly. Um, but there, uh, for example, Area 11, uh, and the, uh, it, it, I mean, it's just pretty darn tough last year, um, June, then, then the summer fishery, and then the winter fishery. Um, so I think there are some areas where from approaching it from the need to avoid the emergency closures is better than looking at it as maximizing angler trips in Puget Sound. Uh, that, well, you'd, you'd have all your fishing in in uh, uh, the urban areas. Area, uh, I mean, it would be concentrated, and you'd be leaving people out, especially the ones where you're having uh, uh, more expense and uh, uh, their their uh, uh, places like Area Five, Area Seven. Um, so, uh, I'm just, just throwing out a caution. I don't, I don't have the time yet to look at these. I, uh, would like to take a, 
I couldn't even really tell where you were putting X's and what those X's meant, but uh, I'll get to those as soon as I can and try to, maybe that's the way that, that I can uh, help with some feedback is get it to you after this session is over and not take up any more time on the real nitty gritty details here. Is that I, I, I do appreciate that, Pat, and um, uh, kind of um, I do recognize that it probably isn't ideal having this tool up on here. I know that the, the writing isn't too huge. Ho hopefully for people online, they can follow along. Um, I think maybe in the future, what might be a better option is uh, recognizing that we won't get all the computing that kind of propagates through and, and makes the check marks. Maybe if I had printouts of this in, in future public meetings, just so I, when I said and, and numbered the options. So I said, you know, option one in Marine Area 5 summer, and that way folks could look down at their papers and see kind of what that means for quotas and things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's a really helpful suggestion because probably a lot of people in the crowd are feeling the same. Um, on kind of um, maybe the, the second place where you went there, um, which was um, looking at kind of um, how much how much quotas needed to keep these areas open. As I've been thinking about kind of these proposals to get down to 95, um, recognizing that I'm I'm, I'm I'm mainly right now looking at areas, even though they're areas that have relatively low Stiligwamish impacts, they're also areas where we've increased and have impacted other stocks relative to our last modeling exercise. And also recognizing that we're I'm, um, uh, kind of in this exercise where we, we are thinking about, say, Marine Area 7, Marine Area 9, some of these places that the quota that they do have, they, they, they really need it to try to keep uh, the portion of season that they had last year open. Thanks, Derek. A couple other thoughts. Uh, one is I, you brought up the, uh, um, while focusing on Stiligwamish, then uh, in Area 11 in particular, uh, the possibility of increasing relatively the Nisqually impacts. And that's what you were trying to avoid or minimize. And uh, so I, I wondered with, with a stock like that, there's been no discussion about what the impacts are in river for non-treaty fisheries versus marine areas. I mean, solving it in a marine area, you lose all that, the, the, the associated impact on other stocks, hatchery stocks with Mark Selective Fisheries for Chinook. And um, that's an important issue. Um, and then my final uh, thought or to leave with you is that, um, do you have any guidance for us about the next steps? I mean, we don't have that much time here today. You don't have much time to spend um, with the public on getting the next proposal for your intention, if, if I'm understanding it is, that you are uh, likely to present a proposal to the tribes uh, today or tomorrow and before next week anyway. And uh, after your discussions, the co-manager discussions, and uh, how can we uh, uh, be informed of what you uh, will propose? You know, that's been a, a little bit of a sticky issue uh, for the public and how we engage effectively. And do you have any thoughts for us about, hey, if you have any ideas, get to the tool, uh, hurry up, uh, uh, politely and respectfully uh, get us your proposals as soon as you can. It's not too late, um, or, or maybe it, it will be by midnight or whatever. Any thoughts you have on a guidance for us for that, that would be appreciated. Thanks. Maybe I'll try to tackle that one first, Pat. I think um, you're right, getting to specifics today is is probably a little harder. Uh, if we had a team of modelers up here to be able just to model everybody's proposal in real time, um, that might be a little more ideal, but not re necessarily realistic. You know, I mean, we we take a lot of feedback, not only through the North of Falcon process, but throughout the year, uh, especially with our advisory groups, you know, we're engaging with them uh, throughout the year on, on fisheries management uh, in season. Um, we hear lots of suggestions there. I, I think Really, what we're looking for are, uh, you know, maybe the what are the easiest decisions we could make together today on on trying to reduce that that Stiligwamish number. Um, you know, I think the ones that Derek has has pointed out on the screen here today are um, 
possibilities. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, if I'm thinking about it um, in terms of where we're going, it, it seems like some of those things we did to, to boost quota in some of these areas might be the easiest ones to start with. But, you know, that's easy for me to say if it's not my marine area, right? Uh, for those folks in 11, as you pointed out, uh, that's that's a tough decision to start reducing quota and, and trying to manage that. So I, I think we're, um, you know, we haven't even really touched a whole lot today on on winter fisheries and, you know, the possibility of adding time in the in the winter and what that might mean for for other reductions uh, in the summer. And so I think it's really just um, having different and varied viewpoints on on what those values are in the fisheries. Uh, where those, you know, kind of uh, opportunities are that people are most important to people. Um, and and we take that into consideration. I mean, I, I'd like to say that we can come out of here together today with a pretty good idea of of where we want to go with our next modeling run and, and have that discussion with folks today before we leave um, and try to center on, on a little bit of consensus. I don't think we're ever going to reach full consensus, but I think we can get close on some ideas that, um, you know, and we're not trying to get all the way down to, to 90 mortalities with this next model run. Um, I don't think we're trying to get all the way there uh, until we have some more information. So I don't know if that fully addresses uh, what you said, Pat, but I, you know, we're really just, uh, we know everybody wants the most amount of time that they can get. Um, we've employed some tools in the recent past with uh, shorter day openers in areas um, you know, certain days of the week uh, that we can try to manage fisheries that way through the year. I know that's always not ideal for predictability and planning, um, but we do have those tools as well to try to help, uh, you know, keep the seasons open as long as we can, make sure that we're checking all the boxes for the, um, the conservation uh, objectives that we're trying to meet. Um, you know, uh, uh, again, I think I, I hearken back to, to Carl, um, we, I think we have some pretty good coho fisheries built in this year that if we do end up closing um, some Chinook places earlier than expected, that um, we're still going to have pinks and coho to be able to prosecute fisheries with. And so I think that's, that's also where I'm thinking about is maybe making some of these smaller reductions in Chinook. Yeah, it's, it's going to be painful, but we do have these other opportunities to, to keep fisheries open and keep people fishing this year. And if, if I could, Pat, just a small follow up, just to clarify, we aren't looking to fix Nisqually um, or Snohomish or some of these other stocks completely through marine fisheries. Uh, we are going to have to do some freshwater shaping for uh, for especially Nisqually kind of as we get through this exercise. We're just trying to be cognizant of places where we can make changes such that uh, that the freshwater fishery doesn't, uh, you know, um, bear the full brunt of that of that change. Carl, go ahead. Yeah, oh, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I, I briefly wanted to, you know, add on to Pat's comment just about as as I pr really appreciate. I've always wanted to move away from paper, and as we transition away from paper and we get into electronics, um, until you guys can afford a larger screen. Uh, maybe setting up the chairs closer and then reminding people to maybe bring their laptops and have Wi-Fi access. We could join the webinar and then we could have the tool right in our laps. And probably there's probably some other solutions that we can come up with as attendees here in person so that we could see the uh, tools ourselves. I didn't bring my laptop today. So, um, uh, so I, I think you guys did a great job of really listening to the public this time and coming up with a lot of tools. I know you, you're never going to make everyone happy. That's the whole process, right? So um, I, getting a really strong message from all the charter groups that I'm supposed to be here to represent is that, you know, folks really want to make it into March in the winter, talking again about these winter fisheries. Um, so they were hoping everyone's like, you know, we don't even care about February. We want to just open March 1st and you know, align with area five and try to get March 1st through April 15th. And, you know, they want to look at that. I don't know if that's realistic or not, because we might be getting into more still Aguamish impacts in April. And maybe if we don't open at the same time as 11, we, we force a bunch of pressure into 11 and we eat up all their impacts. So, um, so the two scenarios, you know, that I, I think of in my head is, you know, either area 10 opens up 
March 1 through April 15th, or if we go, if we end up with a season like is, and you know, these can all change right through PFMC, but you know, if you end up with February 1 through March 1st, we would love to have kind of a, kind of a, you know, some kind of a commitment from the department that they would be considering a, a cautious approach to that February season with like a three-day opener at the beginning so we could, you know, be sure that we uh, can manage the encounters on that fishery with all the high pressure we get, you know, I really think that the general uh, ambition of the fishermen is going to be to go to the northern area to try to get the bigger fish, right? So if area 10 and 11 is open at the same time, a lot of the pressure is going to go into area 10 because there are more fish and there are bigger fish. If area 10 and five or six are open at the same time, they're going to go up to the straits and they're going to try to get the bigger fish. So that's going to relieve pressure from 10. So, you know, the having adjacent areas at the same time open is good. However, 10 and 11 open, 11 isn't going to relieve a lot of pressure from 10. However, it will relieve some. So those are my thoughts on the winter fisheries there for now. And, and you know, I'll continue this conversation after today and into next week. Thank you. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you again. Um, so I think in a whole, I'm far from the smartest guy in this room. Uh, Derek, you put so much into this and it's impressive. And I, I struggle as well with following even with my computer and keeping up. Um, I appreciate the optimism that we're looking at here with trying to optimize the amount of um, mortalities that, that we can, we can have occur in this year's package. Last year, we put a package across the finish line with 63 mortalities. Um, overall, it was relatively successful. I mean, I, I'm not a huge fan of only nine days of fishing in Area 7, but it was successful. We didn't exceed our quota. We uh, were able to manage it correctly. We were able to get uh, input. Um, you guys were really great on getting test fishery numbers to me. Kirsten, I appreciate that. Um, if we look at overall what happened last year and we look at where the problems occurred, uh, we saw early closure in, in 11, we saw early closures in 10, and I believe we had some issues in five potentially. So outside of those, outside of those areas, I'm not sure we really need to change too much. It would imagine, I would think we could take exactly what we did last year, be at the 63 number, and then we could address the problem areas. We can address, um, we can address potentially winter opportunities in seven. We can address potential winter opportunities in 11 and 10. Um, but I, I would think we don't want to recreate the wheel every single year that we can kind of start with that 63 and then put put some of that quota and those mortalities into places that we struggled with. Um, and certainly at Marine Area 11, I don't participate in that fishery, but I know that was probably a pretty tough pill to swallow last year. Um, from from there, the things that we did wrong, it almost looks like we're repeating where we're still seeing February openers in the winter. Um, I think that most guys would rather see that those, those winter opportunities that we are getting to open uh, in March. It's a lot easier on the, on the sub-legals for us in those time periods. Um, and then we'll, we'll, see, we'll see those fisheries actually get through maybe in April 15th, uh, where we know the success rates are greater, weather's probably a little bit better. Um, so my overall input is just that we could probably look at what we did successfully last year, start there, and then take whatever exceedances or whatever extras that we have and apply it to the areas that we struggled with. And to me, it almost seems like we're making things a little more complicated. And I know all the work you put into it, but it's almost too complicated. So thank you so much. Well, um, Alex, I might start off there somewhere. Um, and, um, I'm going to try to see if I can try to portray what's maybe a little bit of a technically complex concept. I'm, I'm going to try to uh, find, find a good way to portray it. So if I fail at that, let me know, and I'll try to find a different way of explaining it. Um, but um, uh, 
right now where we're at in the modeling uh, with the effort, we have had increases in some areas in that effort relative to last year. We've put some additional quota into Marine Area 7. We put some additional quota into Marine Area 6, uh, 11, and 10. Um, and, um, and so because those efforts are the same, what we're actually representing for the most part in kind of our modeling right now is last year's seasons. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the 63 still Aguamish mortalities versus the 990 still Aguamish mortalities, the key piece that 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 model different there that, that that's changing isn't the seasons. Um, it's um, it's, it's more kind of the abundance uh, of, of the still Aguamish stock. So think about hypothetically, Think about uh, you're fishing in an area that has a total abundance of a thousand Chinook. And you are trying really hard to catch those Chinook. You're out there for a hundred hours um, and you're not a very good angler. So you catch 10 Chinook with that abundance of, of a thousand Chinook out there. So you've you've encountered you've encountered one percent of those fish, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. Now imagine now now it's the next year and things are looking a little bit better um, for Chinook and you have an, a total abundance of 2000 out there and you fish for that same 100 hours. When that happens, um, you would expect um, uh, if you were just as good of an angler as you were last year that um, that you might catch uh, 20, 20 Chinook in that scenario because there's double the amount of fish around. Right. So as kind of the still Aguamish abundances have changed and abundances of all the other stocks in the model, but just to keep it simplistic, keeping it at still Aguamish, um, if you're exerting the same effort, if you're exerting the same kind of uh, amount of, of pressure on that stock, when you have that abundance increase, you're going to get a different number of expected mortalities and encounters that comes out. You're in count because there's more still Aguamish fish around. If you put the same amount of effort in, you're going to catch uh, a greater number of still Aguamish fish. So um, just to clarify, and I know that that is a little bit of a complex idea, but how it works out in the modeling, um, that's why we don't see with kind of the same seasons up there. That's why we don't see that same 63 number that we saw last year. If we wanted to achieve that 63 number, we would have to kind of um, make uh, quota reductions. Um, and by quota reductions, I also mean effort reductions across the board, which would result in kind of reduced seasons. Um, and um, uh, j j just to kind of be clear um, on that piece. And um, I've actually, um, I, I really appreciate that you brought that up um, because um, I've received a lot of questions about that this year in email and from folks on, we have more still Aguamish fish. Why, um, you know, what, what, what's happening there? Why, why, is, why is the mortality coming out different? Well, I mean, I'm certainly not suggesting that we, we you know, we want to obviously get the most we can get out of any particular forecast or any particular um you know what, what a season allotment will will provide to us um so i i don't want us to just go ahead and throw a package out there that's 63 mortalities just because of the fact that it, it worked for us or um and i get that if we have a higher abundance of a specific fish stock we we will likely catch that fish stock more often in, in using the same effort um it just for us for me at, at least um we had a successful season in area seven we, we don't necessarily need um, to increase that that quota drastically to um, to provide us the same results that we had last year, um, and and especially as long as we remain in this this period where we're rebuilding the still Guamish stock, um, then this is what we have to work with, and and that's okay with me at least. Um, so I don't want to get too too carried away or too far down a rabbit hole here. Um, but I just, I believe that we could probably simplify this a little bit. Um, and, and, and I guess maybe one question I would have for you, Derek is, is when we talk about the 90, the 90, 93, 95, is there a level of confidence that, that that 90 number is a number that we will get through the finish line, uh, when we start getting into our, our, our co-manager meetings and your PF PFMC meetings next year? Is that is that something that you do truly feel confident about? I think it's likely, I think, like I said, I think it's likely at the end of the process, we'll be at around 92 or 93 mortalities. I have been wrong about that before. There's, there's, there have been some years where I've made a prediction of where we're going to come out at the end and northern fisheries come out different than I expect, or, or a piece comes out different than I expect, and that's kind of shaken things up a little bit. So I, um, uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to answer the question because 
I do think that it will be 92 to 93 mortalities, but I can't say that with 100% confidence. And Understood. that's why that, that's why we're potentially looking at a little bit of a little bit of a range here. If sure. I'm if I'm off on either end, um, by um, you know maybe it comes out as 90, and maybe it comes out as 95. And totally um, either yeah. way, we have options for. But I, I I completely understand that. And just one clarification on the the topic we were talking about earlier about DFO slot limits. So you had mentioned maybe potentially looking at how they they do that and to mimic them. I, I want to just make sure we understand that their slot limits are pertaining to non-marked fish. And so it wouldn't exactly be apples to apples for us. Uh, in Bellingham Bay, do we did we see a date for Bellingham Bay? Did we, did we see a season proposal for that? Um, I think uh, because of our... Uh, protecting those nooksack fish coming back i think august 15 is the typical opener opener through the month of september yes okay great thank you and it looks like we have a couple hands online uh tony you want to go ahead you want to unmute tony Okay, Tony, we'll come back to you. Uh, Hank, go ahead. <clears throat> All right, I, I hope you can hear me. I kind of got a computer sitting behind me and screens in front of me. Uh, can you hear me? All right. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to touch on that the uh, hypothetical that Derek just talked about with you know, you know one guy fishing a hundred hours and and you know, an increased an abundance from one year to another. Does our daily limit play into that calculation? Because you, you know, if you have more abundance, uh, presumably you're going to hit your limit quicker. You wouldn't maybe be able to fish that hundred hours. And so when you, you know, when you're calculating these things out and uh, can you really use the same amount of effort from one year to the next um, and apply it to the increased uh, abundance. You know, just kind of wondering if there's if there's some kind of if there's an error in that rationale. Thank, thank, thanks, Hank. And, um, and the um, the scenario that I was presenting was um, I was I was trying to make something very simplistic, but there are a number of considerations um, of which that's one is that the bag limit uh, plays into it. So if you just had a single person. Um, that was that 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 was fishing. Then they might not spend a um, um, hundred hours fishing. But if you had um, um, you know to achieve those bag limits, if they were out there, say a certain number of days. But um, in that scenario, you are um, modeling as if that person was going out and spending a hundred hours uh, either way, whether they got their bag limit or not. Is kind of what I was thinking. In the in the real world, in the in the real world, how things work is that. There might be less effort necessary for an individual angler to get their their bag limit per amount of time that they're out there if the abundances are greater. Um, but the other piece there that's also worth considering is that uh, effort also changes in 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 depending on the abundance of kind of uh, uh, fish that are around. Uh, um, I think it is possible that we see higher efforts when the fishing is good and lower efforts when the fishing is bad. Um, how all of this um, factors in um, is actually um, not something that's directly accounted for in the modeling because um, when we're looking at kind of proposing an equal effort, um, it's not necessarily looking at how that effort might change in an individual year. Um, it's looking more at kind of if we had the same effort as last year, i.e. not increasing our impacts on stocks, this is what the quota would be. This is, this is uh, what we might expect. Um, so um, the, the reason we're in that situation um, is, um, uh, and folks might remember from the meeting that we had um, two Wednesdays ago, is we, we did look kind of in our previous tool at what might be necessary to get to what we might we, we think we might need for a full season, given kind of recent effort trends and, and the abundance of this year um, and last year's quotas. Um, and in a lot of areas, we saw that um, trying to provide kind of what would be needed for a full season um, is going to put us kind of um, beyond what we would need to be able to be in line with our, our management objectives and our impacts. So um, maybe more information than you wanted there, uh, Hank, but just kind of, um, I've thought a lot about this one and just trying to think, just trying to 
rationalize in my head and maybe give a stream of thought as to how I've thought about kind of some of these some of these issues with effort and bag limits and how it all interacts. Okay. Yeah. Th thanks. I, I I appreciate that. And kind of my takeaway from it is all right. So you you know you have to model it in. It's possible that that in doing that you um, you know you allocate uh, you know you might over allocate some quota to an area. And now if <laughs> once you get to the season, you have your your in season modeling. You know it might work out to our benefit because if the effort doesn't increase uh, and we're doing these on and off day things we might get some extra days it's my simplistic way of looking at it so i'll be you know i'll be lying to my friends and telling them there's no fish up here and, and uh you know maybe they maybe we can stretch our seasons a little bit um <laughs> moving on from that uh just a couple quick comments i appreciate on the tool that you put that column for the uh mortalities per quota um, and I've been sitting here messing with it and, and now kind of trying to back into the mortalities per season based on the quotas that are in the far left and the ratio that's in the far right. So I'm just just to get an idea of really what each of these seasons is costing us. And then the other thing I'm just looking at and just throwing it out there just because I'm sure you guys are considering it is then I go to the next page and I'm looking at the average trips per day and you know, I don't have anything really fully developed, but what's in what's going on in my mind is if we're looking for places to make cuts, uh, because it sounds like we might, there's a possibility we need to find like six fish or, you know, um, I, I'm thinking through it in terms of, of which areas have the fewest trips per day, and then looking at, you know, what kind of impact they have, because if we're trying to, you know, and then also, you know, it, you know how many. Then also factoring in that kind of that ratio that you have, and just just I don't have you know no I don't have a proposal, but I think you know if, if you're going to make cuts someplace, you probably it, it's probably better to cut it someplace where that's not as popular to the extent you can take a couple, you know, free up a couple fish there, and then in other areas you your proposals that you have for the X boxes check boxes are you know they're they're rigid. They're like, we move from this quota to that quota, but it, you know, I think in reality, it looks like you could, um, you know, you could adjust quotas and, you know, in different areas by, you know, a few hundred fish here and a couple hundred fish there and, and maybe find what you're looking for. So my only real comment there is, you know, area seven is a popular area and it benefits the public a lot. So when you're, you know, I, I, I would, say whatever I can to try to protect that. So that, that's just my comment. Thank you, Hank. Hank. We And let me try Tony really quick before we go on to the next hand. Hanny, <laughs> Tony, go ahead. Hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Um, let's discuss Baker Lake this year. Um, what's the proposed uh, opener day? And uh, are we looking at a bag limit of three fish a day? Hang on, Tony. Um, Andrew Fowler's coming to the table to answer that question. Hi there, Andrew Fowler, Skagit District Bio. Uh, yep. Baker Lake will open. I think we've got it proposed for. They got a calendar. What's the Saturday? First Saturday past the eleventh. What? Thank you. Or July fifteenth with the three fish limit. Um, oh, what about? If, what about the rear? Go ahead. Uh, the other proposal we've got out <clears throat> got out there is for a um basically a trigger opening so if there's a certain number of fish are in a lake we could open it up on uh following saturday right now the trigger opening is set at 1500 and for the, the skagit same as past years so it'll be june 16th and uh mount vernon to gilligan and gilligan to dallas three fish limit so are we going to have, uh, I think the proposal was is uh, once 
there was only 25, I think it was either 1,500 or 2,500 fish left in the lake. It was going to be closed. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the spotting escapement. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. You bet. That was our last hand online. Uh, yes, I had a question Gary Krein texted. He asked, asked why um, Marine Area 282 was closing before the end of December. It said the proposal on the draft online said it closed area two non-selective coho through September 23rd or something like that. Maybe there's a conflict with tribal net fishing or something or. So uh, thanks Carl for the question and Gary, if you're listening. <laughs> um, the, uh, the proposal, uh, the first initial coho modeling proposal had us about a thousand fish below the escapement goal for the Snohomish for this year. Okay. So uh, we made a, a small change in the marine area, assuming that there's going to be other changes that are likely to come from the tribal fisheries and potentially the in-river fishery as well to help get us above that escapement goal. Sure. This was a, an initial proposal to help uh, kind of the marine area piece of helping us get to that okay. uh, was the move we made yesterday. Right. Thank you, Mark. And it looks like we have a hand up from Mike. Mike, go ahead. Mike, you can go ahead and unmute. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hey, um, I'm curious what we're looking at for the um, spring Chinook for the North Fork of the Nooksack River, um, what that might look like this year. Do we know, is Julie on the line today? Is that gonna look like next year? I mean, last year? Julie is on the line. I have promoted her to panelist. Julie, if you can help us answer that question, it'd be appreciated. Sure, we're looking at, um, having the same type of fishery that we've had the past two years. Three yeah, where, years. where it opens for two weeks and then you guys take a look at it and then open it for the end of the year, but for we, the rest of the month, I mean, sorry. We're still um, shaping this fishery. We still have some conversations to have with our tribal co-managers, but uh, odds are it will look something like that, yes. Okay, cool, thank you. Yeah, the first part of that, two weeks with all the snow melt and everything, it can be kind of crazy. A lot of fish don't get caught, I think, until the end, that last two weeks. Um, right. But yeah, thank you. Um, I'm new to this whole process and asking questions. It's a lot of information to retain and I appreciate you um, answering my questions. I'm just trying to get some information. Thank you. Sure, glad you're here. Yep, bye. And that was our last question online for right now. Looking around the room to see if there's any other questions or comments folks want to make. Um, go ahead, Pat. Um, I wanted to talk with you about uh, uh, that issue of aligning the winter fisheries uh, to um, potentially have a an effect effective uh, distribution of effort. So there's not a concentration then um, contributing to increased risk of in season actions uh, uh, unexpectedly high 
catch success and effort. Um, uh, so the the um, uh, it's it is hard to to find a unanimity about a, a preferred time, but I think I think it's smart uh, for the department to align the uh, ten and eleven. Uh, it does seem like, well, we've we've gone kind of back and forth between is it all over the place really with eleven especially, but but uh, uh, it might be that the best time is uh, March one to I don't know why we we're talking about April fifteenth why that would be a cutoff maybe it's just March April uh, a period of time we know that there it's the the key there is the quota or the um, the various limits to the fishery controls. So think I'm just saying quota in general, uh, but it, it does seem like um, the, the alignment of 10, a starting date of March 1st might be smart for 10 and 11. It does align with five, the plan for the winter and five. I think there, it's logical to think that there's some interaction there. Uh, people uh, don't have um, people who fish in ten. They they might choose to go to five if it's open. There's there's so I I do think there's logic. It's logical that the effort in those areas, if they were the three areas, five, ten, and eleven, um, you might minimize the angler participation in any one of those by having them aligned in time. I don't know if that's the same with area seven. I think it's a little bit more unique. It's further to get to a little bit more dedicated effort to get there, even though it's close uh, geographic proximity um, for many. I, th I think that's a little bit separate issue. I had, had proposed uh, uh, with that very small quota, just a, something like 600, uh, just to make sure people understood where that came from. I did look at at some kind of a limit that was uh, small enough to not be a big flag with higher impacts, uh, that it could be done just within a rearrangement within area seven. Uh, and the uh, a uh, choice of uh, February for that fishery was because of history. There had been been uh, uh, good winter fishing in throughout the period of December through through uh, April, of course. But but maybe just picking February as a a time that had relatively low effort, and it's it's uh, it can be pretty pretty difficult time to to uh, plan and have a follow through with help from the weather gods at that time. And, uh, but still, I think that one is a little bit unique from five, 10 and 11. So that those are my thoughts about the alignment and working with effort distribution about those winter fisheries. It maybe it'll stimulate some some conversation with other people from those areas. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. I'm going to make one comment, and it's it's uh, one of the issues that the department faces uh, when thinking about that opportunity, especially in February. And this is why uh, staff were actually thinking about maybe more of a uh, an early April opportunity made more sense is just the staffing issue. So for us to to kind of staff up at that time of the year where we currently don't have any fisheries going, um, you know, that that's a that's an effort uh, for us to to get enough staffing to make sure the monitoring's covered, um, the test fisheries are in place, people doing overflights for effort counts, um, those kind of things. Um, so to do it in a time period where we don't currently have fisheries going, um, is a pretty big effort to to do that. Uh, that's where we had been thinking about, you know, the the more recent year phenomenon of of uh, uh, early earlier opportunity for halibut, 
uh, which has started in, in early April now um, in the recent past, or at least this year. Um, and so that that may be a consideration where we'll have staff on um, that we could use for both of those opportunities. Uh, and, and maybe that wouldn't be such a monumental effort for the department to try to, to, to staff up what may be a short opportunity um, to try to do some black mouth fishing. I, I think we could try to be creative, even you know if, if that was something that we were considering going forward about a, a, a late March where we could potentially bring staff on and, and have them do a short Chinook opener and then and move right into halibut. So I think those are a couple of things that we're thinking about. Um, I, I remember those February fisheries well. Uh, there, I think there were several derbies in February in the past as well that helped contribute to, to whatever effort we saw in that month where the weather didn't always cooperate. So uh, really appreciate the thought and the suggestion. We have a hand up from Gabe online. Gabe, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I want to echo what both Carl and Pat said. I, I think fishing farther into the spring is a priority for Area 11. Uh, we would love to see March and April. Um, I, I think the most important thing is, to, to at least for us, with the uh, you know, smaller guidelines to work with down there is that we're concurrent with 10, however, however that happens. And I, I wouldn't want to see 11 open without 10 opening. Um, but if we could move that to March and April, that, that would be best case scenario for us. And we've fished in April in the past. And so we, we'd love to see that happen again. I, I know there's some concerns about uh, White River, but you know, looking through where those impacts are being used, over 12 of the 17% that's used is used in river, and that's obviously not coming from us. So we we we'd support you know moving to uh, March and April if that's an option. We hope hope the department would at least give that a shot. Thank you. Thanks, Gabe. Come on down. New contest model price is right. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, I just wonder what it looked like for a small winter blackmouth fishery in 8182, like starting in March. Just, I'm not sure what the impacts come in on the still Guamish, being that it's right there, but it, it really hurts to have that fishery gone. That's one of my favorites. And typically we run into bigger fish out there later in the season, nice fish, so. That's one. And then I wanted to um, just kind of bring up that we put a lot of time in at the ORCA task force and the commission and everything to make a lot more fish. And in 2022, we got another 23.9 million salmon released for the ORCAs and for us. I mean, was that ever thought about with all the amount of extra shakers out there and some of the you know, early openers for these winter fisheries? That's just something I was thinking if that had an impact on anything. Thanks, thanks, Ron. So I, I might start on the 8182 question. And um, as, um, as it's been identified, there aren't any scenarios in the current modeling tool that, that include that. Um, if you wanted to get kind of a rough idea of the impacts, uh, the, the tool that was presented kind of um, two Wednesdays ago was, was one that did have impacts that you could look at if, if you wanted okay. to. One thing particularly about 8182 is uh, when uh, uh, kind of uh, in the late 2010s, when there was a, a wider grouping of, of areas open, 8182 actually tended to have kind of lower impacts on Stillwamish and many other stocks. But that was uh, at least partially driven by there was also lower catches in, in Marine Area 8 versus Marine Area 9 in the winter or Marine Area 6 or Marine Area 7. Those were kind of three of our bigger hitters in terms of um, in terms of quota and impacts. Um, so kind of um, if we were to model it, um, uh, taking a pretty, uh, you know, kind of a pretty conservative approach, um, uh, what we saw historically as having low impacts uh, might not shake out as uh, quite the same. Um, but um, 
but for this year particularly and um as mark and others have spoken to uh right there's there's a lot of concern this year for all the s rivers for stiligwamish snohomish skagit all three of those are over their objectives um and um so um it's um uh it's something that we can take a look at okay thanks Any questions online, Leah? We just had a hand raised. And uh, real quick before I call the next caller, uh, just to remind folks online, um, I've seen a few drop and join on the phone. If you want to, on the phone, you'd like to raise your hand, star nine. Uh, and go ahead, Robert. Um, Derek, I was curious with the Area 11 winter fishery, what happens if we move that Inter into uh, March and April in terms of impact. Does that help it at all, or is it all modeled still the same on impacts? Because the, I, I'm just wondering if a lot of those juvenile fish are going to clear, you know, the later we open it. Thanks, Rob. So, um, I guess the short answer for that one is that the um, the stock composition. Uh, would be modeled as the same regardless of whether it was in uh, February or, um, or 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 April. The the way that kind of the modeling uh, works out is that to get a representative sample size of CBTs, we have the model divided up into time steps, um, and uh, those two lump in the kind of um, what what's our time step for is what we call it in the model. It's 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 the same time step. So uh, the the the, uh, the the stocks encountered uh, would would be the same. Um, I guess the question on um, kind of um, if we shifted around the time, uh, it would depend on kind of how we modeled it as to how it would change the potential impacts. Would we want to kind of account for changing that time period and maybe either um, uh, increasing or decreasing the quota depending on kind of um, historic looks at that period being open and seeing if we would need more or less than that period? Um, or would we want to kind of keep it the same effort in a similar approach that we've been doing for a lot of the marine areas to 2022? Um, it, it would, even if we kept the same effort, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to just look historically and see kind of when there was an opening across uh, uh, different sets of months in area 11, um, how, um, you know, what, what percentage of the catch was caught in April versus March versus February, et cetera. Yeah, I fished it in March and April, but not um, in February. So I just was curious that data would be interesting. And if it has less impacts on juveniles, which tends to be um, a problem for us, it might be something to look at. And that would probably apply to Area 10 as well. Thanks, Robin. I don't know if Ty is in the room or if he stepped out for a minute, but maybe Kirsten has some insights. We have looked at this in the past in terms of Area 10, um, shifting kind of that opening and uh, what month we start fishing in and how that affects juveniles. Kirsten, do you have any more thoughts on that? Yeah, Ty's done a bunch of modeling to look at kind of how cohorts move through that fishery and the, and the kind of the different size classes and what we think are different age classes that are moving through it. And, you know, there is a pretty predictable uh, change in the size of fish from kind of say January 1. <laughs> Um, that doesn't necessarily always work out. We kind of hope that that would be the situation this year with Area 10, and we didn't really get there. We still had a really high number of sublegals. It just didn't follow the same pattern as it tends to do or has done in the past from years that we've looked at. Um, so, but that is something that we've considered looking at too, is kind of modeling it based on when we think that those cohorts are going to um, move through that are, you know, are the, the bigger size classes. So it's still something we're kind of playing with. I wouldn't say that it's really hammered out completely, but it's definitely something that we've explored um, and like I said, uh, like Derek said, Ty has done some work with this and he just stepped out so we can we can get with him and get you some better answers. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, with regards to the comment that uh, Ron Warren made or Ron Garner made, there was there is a lot more um, hatchery fish now with the um, post orca increases um, in salmon. And I'm just wondering, um, are we going to we're probably going to go up a, a lot in hatchery fish but probably not so much up in wild fish. And I'm just wondering if you've looked at that. Um, I, 
I think it's worth looking at, Rob. It's not something I've looked at right now in the modeling. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. You, you guys have done a really good job trying to look at all kinds of things this year, and it's appreciated. We have another hand online from Art. Art, go ahead. Yes, um, I'm looking at that um, proposed winter fishery in Marine Area 11 and listening to some comments. Um, uh, I've had the good fortune, I guess you could call it, for being able to fish and also run a business in that area for uh, pretty close to 50 years. And traditionally, um, February, especially January, February, um, a lot of those fish migrate out of that area. You can get really, really slow and clear into at least the middle of March. And then about that time, uh, typically middle of March and into April, we start getting fish back into the area and the bulk of them are a little larger in size. Um, so I just thought I would speak to that, um, just uh, give you some historical perspective also, um, I too have, uh, in fact, I think I've sent emails in the past um, to see if Derek or whoever had modeled the increase of hatchery production in, into the models um, and, uh, uh, and how that would affect the modeling. So uh, uh, thanks for that. Thanks, Art. That was our last hand online. Well, this is the point of the meeting where I usually start talking and then somebody will eventually raise their hand, but uh, just really appreciate everybody's time and participation uh, this meeting and this year. Um, these are these are never easy discussions for us uh, about trying to to shape these. Uh, um, we're we're usually talking about reductions, which is never a fun thing. But I think, uh, as I stated earlier, I think we do have some uh, some opportunities to be optimistic this year about uh, salmon seasons, particularly on. Um, on coho and pinks coming back this year, I, I think uh, uh, eventually we'll we'll narrow down a Chinook package that that provides uh, opportunity sound wide uh, for people to fish Chinook uh, and and get out there and 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 enjoy uh, that that activity which we all share and love. Um, just a reminder, uh, we are uh, planning on doing uh, check-in meetings next week while we're in California. I know there's. A few folks who are traveling down to to help us uh, make decisions around salmon seasons uh, as we move through the process next week. Um, but we will have uh, morning check-ins starting on Monday the third. Uh, the The actual council meeting starts on Sunday the the second. A uh, number of us will be arriving uh, Friday and Saturday. Um, uh, uh, various activities uh, heading into the council meeting. Um, we're thinking, you know, by, by Monday, we should be down to a, a singular ocean option, hopefully, uh, that we can start uh, shaping our, our inside fisheries in Puget Sound and, and the, the coastal fisheries in Columbia River once we, we center in on a, a singular ocean option. A um, lot of moving pieces to try to put all this puzzle together uh, as we get towards the end of next week and, and the council meeting. Um, as Kirsten said at the beginning, there is a public comment portal uh, that is on the website, will remain on the website. Uh, we've been trying to keep uh, the fisheries proposals there current as they are. Uh, I think the, the coho proposal that we worked on yesterday should be uh, the, up there today for comment uh, and change. Uh, we do uh, look at all those comments. We get regular, our, our rules coordinator, uh, download those for us and make sure they're disseminated for, for staff uh, consideration as we're moving through this process. So please, if you do uh, have uh, uh, an opinion or a comment that you'd like to make about a proposal, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, other thoughts or comments that folks wanna bring to the table about uh, this planning season? 
And we have a few hands online, Mark. Uh, I'll go ahead with Bart. Bart, you can unmute. Bart, you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, last year in Area 11 summer, fishery was a four day opener. I didn't see on the modeling this year, but is it a seven day that you're proposing or is it still a four day opener for the summer Marine Area 11? So the the number of days, uh, I mean, we're, 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 we're trying to uh, essentially calculate a full season when we're doing the modeling. The, the number of days open is really a, a management tool that helps us try to extend uh, that quota through the season. So I, I think we enter in the planning process as planning a seven day fishery. And then depending on where those numbers lay out, uh, we, we often work with our advisory groups and other uh, local people who, who provide us feedback that uh, uh, about what those seasons may look like given, given whatever those quota levels end up at. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Well, are we modeling for a four day fishery or are we modeling for a seven day fishery? So I, I think I just said we're modeling for, we're planning for a seven day fishery uh, right now, but depending on where those numbers come out, we may choose to open less days a week. Okay, thank you. Yep. Next one, Leah. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you had someone in the room. Um, our next hand is from Art. Art, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, real quick, um, could you tell me or give me an idea of what the impacts are on the Nisqually wilds in marine areas one through four? Stand by, Art. I'll have an answer for you in just a moment. Thank you. So our, across all the across the non-treaty fisheries um, in uh, marine areas one through four, we're looking at uh, an ER on the wild stock of 5.4%. Uh, Keeping in mind that for Nisqually this year, um, uh, while the 47% total ER objective might come into play, really what we're looking at is we're looking at changes to escapement um, because we're trying to get above that low abundance threshold. Right. And that's non-tribal? That's non-tribal. Thank you. We have another hand up. The hand is from Hank. Hank, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to be sure I understand the, the public input uh, going forward. Um, so the modeling tool we're looking at right now doesn't take into account data that you're supposed to be receiving you know tonight or something like that um and this is like our last opportunity to comment on these changes um so is there i mean what's going to be shared with us after today as far as you know proposed um changes to the this <laughs> proposed changes to the proposed seasons and how do we comment on that because like right now i'm looking at the the public input page on the WDFW website. And you know, like the the seasons that are up there, I think were the uh, the structure that was from like a week ago. So what do we do going forward if, if we wanna see what you're proposing and make comments on it? Thanks for that, Hank. Uh, so uh, the process from, from my point of view is as I see things playing out in the next few days, as Derek said, by by today, sometime today, 
we should have those northern fishery inputs uh, that we can throw in the model and start to gain some clarity on what those northern fishery impacts are going to be. Um, I don't think uh, I don't think we have any other check-ins planned with the co-managers today. Um, so essentially, we would take public feedback today on what we heard, uh, some of our own ideas around fishery shaping, and take that take what we learned from northern fisheries and try to uh, you know come to the co-managers tomorrow with a proposal for uh, a something a different season structure than what we first proposed um, trying to uh, make some progress on getting that uh, stilly exploitation rate down um, again I think this is an iterative process we don't I don't think we're we're planning on trying to center in exactly on that number uh, after the modeling this week uh, so we would make that decision uh, we'd put it in a package, we'd put it up on the website for consideration uh, when we get it into the model, um, and we'd probably post that likely by Thursday or Friday uh, to the website for comment, uh, and then we would uh, take that into consideration for further fishery shaping uh, as we go down to California. Um, I would um, guess uh, there may not be much other co-manager modeling until we center in on an ocean option. Um, so once that takes place down in California, then we'd likely make another move. So uh, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd likely have some better clarity on that with that first Monday meeting on the 3rd uh, about what that looks like and where we are. And then we would share that information uh, via email or on the website uh, about kind of the next steps from there. Uh, hopefully that answered your question. Okay, so we just you know, so we need to keep a close eye on that um, that public input page is what you're saying. And I know uh, we're we're developing an email list of folks who are interested uh, in in kind of getting updated info. Uh, it'll be uh, our advisors and some other uh, key constituents that we work with throughout the year. We'd be happy to add your name to that distribution as we're we're in California. Uh, any other folks uh, that would like to have that info, um, please feel free to uh, email Kirsten Simonson uh, at dfw.wa.gov, and we'll we'll get you on that list for communication while we're in California. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think my other suggestion would be like anytime you update the, you know, what's available on the public public input page, just for the general public, it'd be good if there was, uh, you know, an email that comes out because we get all these, if we're signed up for notices, we get these ones when there's, you know, a, a commission meeting or a whatever, you know, it'd be nice if, if an email went out that said, you know, uh, the public input uh, page has been updated with the most recent, you know, proposed package or something that's just so the public is well informed. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you. And and public affairs is in the room and, and uh, we'll take that comment. Thank you. So Leah, uh, we have one in the room. Alex, go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, Kirsten, I'm not sure if it's you. Do you know when those coho uh, amendments will be reflected in those that proposal slide that has all the marine areas? Um, they should be updated. If they're not already up online, it should be up online today. OK, yeah. great. Uh, I will acknowledge and say thank you for that. That's an awesome amendment. Uh, I think I was pretty vocal about that. So um, question on the Canadian numbers for future negotiations. Are we to ever expect to have those numbers available for this particular meeting in the NOF process? Uh, you, you might be able to assist me in letting me know in the past, has it ever been available for this particular, this kind of this last major public meeting that we, we, we review the modeling? Is it, are those numbers available? It does. It does vary a little bit each year, um, but um, but typically the standard is that that they're due on April first. So they're usually pretty close to that April first date. There's been a little bit of wiggle room back and forth uh, each way. I I can't you know I, I'd have to look back in in my records and and see kind of if there was a time that for today's meeting that would have been available. Right. Um, I I do know that um, at some times in the past uh, when there's been. Uh, problems with kind of a either agreement on those Canadian numbers or whatnot that it has actually bled till the end of this mm -hmm. of of the North of Falcon 2 where sometimes we don't get it until the very beginning of PFMC 2 or 
or maybe even the first day or two after that. But um, but um, uh, no, I don't think that there's, uh, uh, at least in the way that it's currently established, I don't think that there's a, a good way of, of, of speeding things up um, with, with the process up there. Okay, uh, just noting that it, this is really good what we do here. We kind of get an idea of what we're gonna look at or what we have to build on moving forward past this, but we all know that most of these decisions and most of these packages are really going to be um, adjusted and, and trimmed uh, post NOF2. Um, and, and so it's almost like it's a mystery still for us when we walk out of this meeting. It'll be a mystery for us and for you as well until until next week, of course. Um, when you are looking at your modeling tool here, Derek, when you get to that 90 AEQ number, are you are you within that still Guamish exploitation rate? um objective number um well isn't um, it the nine and 14 honestly uh no because um because there would still need to be ch shaping that occurs on the treaty side but um but we have uh in in recent years we have had um agreements on where we need to be and being at that kind of uh 50 50 sharing on those mortalities um so if we say um once again i, I expect that around the end being somewhere around 92 93 uh, if we got to that today, uh, then we would not be meeting our civil Guam's objectives unless the tribes provided inputs that also uh, got to 92 or 93 on their end. Okay, so they would they would have to have some sort of reduction as well for us ultimately to meet that. Uh, and and this, which just makes me think of something, and I'm not sure if Mark can speak to this or not, but how often are those changes or deductions happening on the non-treaty side versus the treaty side when we get to the point in that table where we're a percent or two off uh a mortality or two off um do do we see true negotiation there or is it usually that we go to the rec the the non-treaty package and we make those adjustments the non-treaty package in order for us to to meet those those limits i'm i mean I, I know you're limited on how much transparency you can give into those processes but if there's anything you can share i think that would be great for us to know well i mean so this is my um 13th north of falcon and i would say that um it's never really been the same any year um, I think there's there's some years where maybe the the non-tribal side gives a little more, and there's some years where we've seen uh, some of the treaty fisheries kind of step up and and you know reduce their fisheries a little bit more. Just depends on the the fishery, the area, and the season, and what we're trying to deal deal with as as far as the the weak weakest stock or you know the one that's the most constraining to to all of our fisheries. Um, you know, it may sound kind of cliche, but there really is an, an honest effort to try to find uh, catch balancing, I think, as as Pat talked about earlier. And, and you know, um, we're going to be over exploited on some uh, stocks uh, and the tribes are going to be, uh, you know, uh, over the 50 percent or whatever on some stocks. And we just try to find that balance together uh, to make sure that we're meeting all those objectives. So it's it's a give and take. Yeah. Yeah, and I've been outspoken before. I, 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 we don't control what happens with treaty season structuring. Um, I try to shy away with um, making it an us versus them. That's that's just not in my DNA. Uh, and I, and I, I would like to see us put most of our efforts um, in in the, these meetings for our the control over what our recreational side does. Um, I, I just don't want the meeting to end short if there's things on my mind. So. Uh, Abundances. We we've had the discussions before regarding abundances and the department's limited ability to predict what fish is in what particular area at any particular time, but we are able to say with some form of certainty that marine areas five, marine area seven have the the largest amount of impacts on still Guamish fish stocks. Um, if we're able to determine that to some form of um, certainty, I'll use that word lightly. Um, then how come we can't also make some sort of determination that in some of these area seven summer fisheries that we are seeing an abundance of Samish River fish in those areas at that time? Um, and if we're not able to populate that data, how do we assist or how do we move forward to get that data um, 
So I'll take a crack at that first and I'll let Derek fill in anything that I'm missing. Um, so keeping in mind that the those numbers that we were showing earlier, you know, kind of what stocks are in what areas during what seasons as an aggregate over a number of years of data that's already been collected. So it's already data that's in hand from coded wire tags and things like that. So it's it's things that we know to be true and it's aggregated over a number of years for those areas. So that's how those those kind of, you know, the, the stock breakdown per area are kind of assigned basically mm -hmm. for the modeling purposes. And I'll let Derek fill in anything that I, I'm missing there. <clears throat> so um, uh, the coded wire tags uh, for designating stocks right now is the best tool that we've got. And that's what we're using uh, for Chinook. Um, there's um, of course, potentially um, in the future that might change as things like GSI advance mm -hmm. as, uh, but right now uh, GSI is not kind of at a stage where um, uh, where it can differentiate individual uh, 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 Chinook stocks by, by, by river. Um, there can be some differentiation. For example, you might be able to tell that this was a spring stock from uh, the North Sound, or maybe this was a fall stock from Mid Sound, but um, kind of um, that level of differentiation that we would need to be able to split out the stocks is, is not there at the moment. It's one of these kind of exciting pieces that we're hoping as kind of the technology moves forward, we might be able to get uh, a larger sample size and better information on exactly what we're encountering in our fisheries. Um, so just to kind of add on to that a yeah, little bit, please. the other pieces that we don't have is we don't really have a way to calculate total abundance in the marine areas of mixed stock fisheries in season. And that's something that we just, we don't have the ability to do that. We don't have a designated fishery that's doing kind of this not, you know, fishery independent sampling where we're actually able to get at abundance estimation of these stocks. If, even if we had that, even if we had some way to be out there. So it's different for say like the chum fishery where they're doing, you know, they, they have a metric to do in season kind of abundance estimates of that species in that area because of the way that chum moved through the areas and the way that that's been designated and the, the amount of years of data that they have um, for that fishery and for that technique, you can get an abundance estimate from that. We don't have that yet for say Chinook stocks in a mixed stock fishery in the Puget Sound. Even if we did have that, we would still need to get at the pieces that are total abundance of all of all the, the aggregate of all Chinook mm -hmm. in the area, and then be able to real time break that down into each individual stock throughout the Puget Sound, which as you can imagine, would be a, a really, lot. really difficult yeah. piece. So either that would kind of involve, you know, a GSI situation where you can kind of break down like by genetic sampling, kind of where these fish are coming from. That's also really hard with hatchery stocks because a lot of the hatcheries has are from the same, same. derivative. Yep. So there's not a whole lot of genetic differentiation between say, you know, one hatchery to another. Agreed. Um, so there's, there's problem with that. So, you know, even if we could get at some of these pieces, there's a lot, you think of the amount of information that's going to go into doing what, what that would entail um, is just a lot. And so even if it was like, a, you know, a coded wire tag or some other kind of tag situation, you'd still have to have in season real time breakdown of where all those fish were coming from which stock and think of how many Chinook stocks there are yeah, yeah. so it's a massive undertaking to do that even if we had the total abundance piece which is a massive undertaking in itself and i think that we have some ideas of how to go about getting total abundance estimation um this is something that i've talked to everybody knows that i'll start geeking out about it but there's ways that you know we've kind of talked about and thought about ways to get at that total abundance piece um, but, you know, we're still a long ways off from being able to kind of get at that, you know, stock by stock in season abundance to be able to update like in season yeah. fisheries. Yeah, yeah. Management. And it, we, you and I have spoken on that before. And, and um, there's, there's a many theories on, on what a fish does in a particular area. Uh, um, being at someone who, who adamantly fishes in that marine area seven and i actually will be open and say my preferences in, in the rosario Strait areas uh and also even in the bellingham channel areas um it's hard for me not to say that there's some sort of connection uh between when we're seeing a really healthy return on samish river fish over the last few years and i'm also seeing really um really successful hatchery or marked fish encounters um during my days on the water um so it it speaking from the recreational side it's really easy for us just to look to the department and say um well there's a lot of hatchery fish because we're catching a lot of hatchery fish but i understand the uphill battle it is for you guys to really take data and implement it into what we do here with with 
with predictions on it on impacts on certain fish stocks and um and what have you uh, i just it, again i'll repeat it, i just it, it feels like there should could be some sort of correlation between when we see you know this next year over 46,000 Samish river fish coming back um that that might have a connection with why we're seeing such successful fishing in some of the interior uh, uh, area seven waterways. Um, no, I was just saying, I'm like, I, sure. I mean, that's, you know, the correlation part is there, but I, I would be a bad stats nerd if I didn't point out sure. that correlation does not equal causation. So just because you're having really totally. good success for anglers, uh, you have to keep in mind that, you know, fishery, like, Hook and line fishing is a pretty biased sample of what's happening. You're selecting for certain sizes, you're selecting for certain times of the year, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not necessarily that angler success does not necessarily equate to higher abundance. Um, and, you know, you kind of have a small snapshot of something, you know, of one area that's going to a much larger stock. So yeah. relation, I sure, like you can see those things, but that doesn't, that six angler success in one, on one area, one part of one fishery to maybe one stock is not necessarily going to like, you know, lead us to be able to use that it. for in season. I get success. it. Are we seeing uh, CWT data on Samish River fish in Area Seven fisheries krill sampling? Um, I would have to check with the sampling unit to get out, to get more information about that. But I, I would assume yes. But I'd have to dig into that a little bit. And is there a mailing address that I can cut off the heads of my fish and mail them to? Because <laughs> I don't often have, get krill sampled. Uh, you can email me. That. I'm, I'm sure there <laughs> is. I will get that information for you. And let okay. You know. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Mostly Bellingham Bay. Or uh, Area 7, sorry. There was a time when we had buckets of vinegar sitting around that people used to drop snouts into. I'm not going there, Ron. <laughs> Any other thoughts or comments or questions folks have uh, about fisheries planning? So I'll, I'll kind of go over next steps. Uh, staff, we're gonna take all the feedback we heard today, um, go through some of the comments and try to uh, formulate a game plan going forward uh, for for what uh, next steps might be in fisheries changes. I would expect we'll, we'll have that out um, um, for folks to consider in the next day or so uh, after we do those, those uh, get that modeling on the table. Um, and I would encourage folks, as I said, uh, next week while we're in California, uh, we'll be available every morning at nine, um, probably for just about an hour, depending on uh, what those meetings look like through the day. Um, I know at the very least, uh, Kirsten and Derek uh, and Angelica will likely be there at nine. Um, some others may have to be at meetings, uh, but, but we'll definitely uh, try to bring folks up to speed uh, as we can. And for folks who miss that, can't be there in the morning, we will record those, have them online for people to view uh, if they can't make it in the morning. And, and like we said, the, the comment portal will remain open uh, until we get uh, a final fishing package, I think, into uh, late this weekend or early next week. Um, with that, there's no other questions or comments. Just a huge thank you to the DFW team. Uh, besides the people up here, uh, there's a lot of people in the back that are uh, do a lot of the hard work on the ground, uh, collecting a lot of the information that we use for fisheries planning. So just a, a, a really dedicated, uh, awesome group of people um, to put all this stuff together for, for us to, to keep these fisheries open for folks. So uh, thanks to all of them. And thanks again to, to you folks for being here today and the, the people online. Leah, one last check. Any questions online? Nope, no one's online. Uh, and thanks to, to Leah as well. So um, with that, uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate you being here. Travel safe. And uh, we'll talk to you soon.